This is what they play for. World Series time, FT Live. Braun, Prusinski, Todd Father, Kratz. We're all betting men. Who had the Diamondbacks and Rangers on their list <laughs> for World Series? Like, if I asked you to come up with scenarios of what the World Series would look like, how far down your list would I have had to get to Rangers, Diamondbacks if this was April? If this was August. <laughs> this was October 1st. <laughs> yeah. If it was July, when they were both in first place, uh, then yeah, still... I'd be like, wow, these guys are unbelievable. I still would have said, eh, Dodgers, Astros. That's such mm. a crass answer, too, to remember that they had good times in July together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, but the recall is incredible. Like I said, though, it is October, incredible. October yeah. 1st, when the playoffs started, when the playoffs kicked off, well, in October for October 3rd, yep. and you would have said the Diamondbacks, Rangers, we all would have been like, no oh, chance, especially with the gauntlet the Diamondbacks had to go through, right? I mean, going through who they went through, the Dodgers who've crushed them, the Brewers who are a first-place team, yep. the Dodgers who have owned them, and then the, go to Philly? No chance. And then the Rangers, obviously, Tampa Bay, Baltimore, and then their arch nemesis, Houston. Good for both these teams, man. I'm happy for both these teams. I know people outside of Dallas and Phoenix – they're like, ah, this World Series sucks. So I'm happy for these teams because a lot of people are happy to see new blood. Before we charge the mound about, you know, what happened last night, Top Father, why do you think so many people are complaining? I mean, and maybe there are more or less than we think, but, you know, there's definitely people like, oh, boring matchup or, oh, bad for, you know, TV ratings, which we joke about, right? But, like, that's not our responsibility to worry about, you know, what networks and what the league is making. Listen, I – I worked out for the first time in like three months today, and that's all the people were talking. They came up to me to like, "Yo, dude, this stinks, man. I'm not watching this." Day. Every, every, I'm telling you, at least a handful of guys that I was, you know, working out with over there was like, "Yo, dude, what do you think now, man? This is, you know, not many people are gonna watch it." Listen, you got some new blood coming in, man. You gotta watch this series. These boys can play. Adolis Garcia is an absolute stud. Uh, Jordan Montgomery just made himself seven figures. Uh, I mean, this this is a Texas team that is not to be messed with. And you got Arizona Diamondbacks with a rookie of the year in Corbin Carroll. Um, their pitching staff has been phenomenal. Their bullpen has been one of the best in this in this playoffs. And that's just to name a few people. And I kept telling these guys, just watch, man. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Just take a gander at this. And really take a look at some of the upcoming phenoms that are coming to play here, and guys that have been there before. You know, there's there's some there's some absolute beasts of baseball players, and it's going to be like this for for a while of these guys doing this well. And I'm really, I'm excited to watch. It. And I told them, listen, it's not the Phillies, not the Yankees, it's not the Mets. You know, over here in the East Coast, not the big dogs anymore. But guess what? This might be a change in the guards. We never know what's going to happen. I also just can say this because I'm from the Northeast. I think Kratz, the Northeast bias kicks in. Plus, I mean, Todd Father's going to a Jersey workout class, and there's no teams they might be paying attention to. The Mets aren't in, the Yankees aren't in, the Phillies aren't in, the Red Sox aren't in. You know, this is middle of the country against, you know, the West. I feel like I feel like anybody that does jazzercise with Todd is definitely <laughs> is definitely a Diamondbacks or Rangers fan. Either way, but look, <laughs> like that. this is this is good for baseball. Twenty of the thirty teams have been to the World Series since two thousand and one. Twenty of the thirty. Now, if it's all the same teams, if it's like I, you even said it the other day, like ugh, you know the Astros, like we want to see the Rangers in it. Like if it's the same teams over and over again, we complain. Like how about we shine shine the light on like these two teams, like people who are complaining about this is who's going to who's going to be in it. And they couldn't be more stark opposites. Two teams that the one similarity is their ERAs both were kind of eh, mid as a team, but they're going to steal bases. The Dimebacks are going to steal bases. The Rangers are going to bop the ball. So basically, based on how I've been betting and guessing on this, 
The Rangers are going to steal more bases, and the Diamondbacks are going to hit more home runs. So I have no idea. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's officially also charge the damn mound so we can get into some of the big topics and some of the petty stuff, too. So let's start with the celebration for the Diamondbacks on the field. Alec Thomas, who was actually one of the first FT guests ever, um, has a Diamondbacks flag. The whole team does, right? And he took it and planted it in the turf. Let's see it right there. Oof. Grounds crew's pissed, by the way. Grounds <laughs> no, crew gets rated. pissed. Season's over, bro. Nobody cares. The air rated. <laughs> but have you they ever... got six months to get that field ready for next year. Have you ever seen... Um, it's usually security with like media where their like foot will like touch like some dirt and they'll be like, Hey, Hey, do you want to get arrested? It's like, okay. Meanwhile, someone just planted a stake in your field. Just saying. Again, pack your shit boys. Season's it's over. over. It's over. Got six months to get it ready for next year till March or April. Would you be pissed if you're the Phillies? No, no dude, come on. I, no, I loved it when like, what was it Manziel? No, it was uh no, well, Manziel, uh, Baker Mayfield. Freaking in Ohio State in the middle. Like, that stuff's cool, man. Like, that stuff is what sports are about, and they're just having fun. This isn't meant towards the Phillies. This wasn't meant towards the players. This is just guys having fun and stuck the flag in the ground. It said champions nationally. Listen, the Diamondbacks have bragging rights. They're the champions of the National League. And all the people that don't like it, all the people that say, oh, there's too many wild card teams, they still went through the teams and beat them. Teams that everyone thought was going to cruise the World Series. So listen, they they do the winner go the spoils, do whatever the hell y'all want. Like they said, jump in their pool if they want, but go enjoy it, D-backs, because who knows how long until it'll happen again. And they're nice guys. That that's actually true. Remember, Seawald was on with us about a week ago, and he's like, "Hey, listen, if we lose in Arizona, they can jump in our pool." You know, that's cool. Yeah. That's good sports. And plus, Alec Thomas, I've known since he was about four years old, so. Is he a my badass? boy, my boy, representing with me like something I would do. Is he a badass? I mean, I don't know if he's a badass, but I mean, we had him on. He's a good yeah. kid. His dad was a badass. We had him on. He's like, you know, I don't even know if the season had started. So it was at WBC, so it was early. Yeah, I mean, he's a rookie, so you know, he's easing in. I bet you, if we speak to him now, he would have like a little more, I, yeah, a little more confidence. Yeah. No, 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 he definitely would. But he also got sent down this year. That's true. So listen, there was a lot of great stories. I mean, we talked about it last night on the post game, like. Ginkle got sent down, right? Yeah. Fought wasn't there all year. I mean, there's a lot of great stories on this Diamondback team. Just people don't know them because they're in Arizona. Yep, that's true. Paul Seawald wasn't on the team, and he addressed the team afterward. All right, all right, all right, all right. Oh, yeah. um, oh shit, sorry. Yeah, we usually don't do this when we uh, pop champagne, but uh, this is a, a nice tradition. Congratulations to everybody, National League champs. And Put that um, on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I mean, not only is he a closer, right? This isn't like the position player, everyday dude who's leading the squad. He wasn't on the team as of a few months ago, Todd Father, and now he's he's the dude doing the speech. Like, who usually does the speech during a celebration yeah, I, like that? It's amazing to see that a guy just coming over. I I take it back to a while ago. I played with him with the Mets, and you you think about where he started. You know, he wasn't. That guy, he, you know, he'd come in, you know, when the team was down a lot and, you know, he'd be that, you know, three, four inning guys that would have to just come in and, you know, you know, put the team at bay. You know, we'd be up by a lot. And now for him, his resilience to understand that, you know, I still got something in the tank. This isn't who I am going to a different team after he was with the Mets, making a name for himself over in Seattle and now doing what he's doing. I mean. Kudos to him, man. That's hard to do, especially going into New York. You know, people booing you left and right. He went in there, gave those fans the ear. He, he knew he was he was cocky, he was confident about the whole thing, and now you know he's he's leading this team after a couple of months. I mean, that goes to show you why baseball is the best sport in the world, man. You can come from a different culture, a different atmosphere, a different team. Doesn't matter who you are, but there's a family always for somebody, especially in the sport. So you go to Arizona after Seattle. And they treat you like that, man. That that's really cool. And uh, congratulations to him. Hey, have you been on for any of our Seawald interviews yet? 
I've been, I've been on once or twice, I, at least once, yes. Okay, just making sure, because yeah. I'm like, obviously, we got to connect the dots there, but maybe we've done it already, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, at least once. 200-something player guest appearances, so yeah. it all starts to pile together. Kratz, let's run through some Zach Gallon shade on social. Uh-oh. It's from, you know, similar neck of the woods. Yeah, Northeast fans, you want something to root for? You got plenty. If you're a Mets fan, you could root for Scherzer. You could root for Seawald. If you're a Jersey fan, you could root for Gallon. There's plenty of Northeast um, ish to it. So Gallon had some some fun retweets and gifts and stuff like that. If we've got it, we'll run through it. Because here we go. It's Fifty Cent. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. He didn't pitch. Did you think he was going to pitch? By the way. No. He was available. Yeah. He Wheeler was. pitched. Two different, different wavelengths. Diff, different games too, right? So they meaning, had a lead. Meaning they had a lead the whole time, and Tori Lavella was able to use his bullpen exactly how he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Thompson was chasing. Again, once you get behind in these games, you start chasing. We saw with Houston, right? You got to start chasing, chasing. It messes up your script like Joe Madden talked about yesterday, right? But mm-hmm. Tori Lavella's script was perfect because he got fought to go what he got, four innings. Right, and then he went to the lefty. He went to uh, Mantiply, right, and then he saw Frank, and then Thompson, Ginkle, boom. Ginkle a little <clears> earlier <throat> than they probably but still, wanted, but who cares? But who, if you can't get him to be five outs in the eighth inning of seventh and eighth inning of Game Seven of the Deal of the World Series, I think you could have given you ten. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Ginkle could have started the way he was throwing. That shit he was throwing was filthy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that's why because they had to use Wheeler because they they were just trying to hold it down. Plus they had to go to their relievers. Boom, 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 boom. They're higher leverage guys. So it was it was just different ways it was run. But listen, Tori Lavello, that was a dream scenario for him. Yep. Yep. And Crazy. for Arizona, I mean, they got to play their brand of baseball these last couple of games. So we're going to talk to uh, Scott Fransky, who has been doing Phillies radio for a long time. Kratz, how, how do you think he's going to be? Because he's getting checked in right now. He's tremendous. This guy's this – guy's- I mean, I feel like Philly has, maybe I'm biased, but I also worked with these guys and played as these guys announced. Like to have T-Mac and Scott Fransky, as long as they have at TV and radio, like so pro, he's going to be, he's going to be a little bummed, but he just, he's usually a melancholy person. So I'm, I'm more interested (laughs) to see what he's, what he's going to do in the off season now. Bummed or pissed? Cause like most Philly fans right now are, are pissed off. I mean, not at the players necessarily. I think it was such a lovable team if you're a Philly fan. And we'll, you know what? Let's just table it because we'll talk to him about it. They don't know what to yell at. So they got, kudos, they, kudos they, they for got Fransky. The, they got the Eagles coming up. They're fine. Kudos for Fransky coming on here after he was just ousted last night. So that's my guy. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're about to get him in. So. Let's uh, hit a quick break. We'll run through the poll for you first. The question revolves around league employee Chris Mad Dog Russo. Should he retire, apologize, donate his paycheck? That's good. That's a Kratz special. Or stop making wild comments. Watch stadium.com slash foul territory. QR code on your screen. Yeah. Donate millions? Nah, I don't think so. Be right back. <laughs> like. Where was he with the Yankees? They, they viewed him, Kratz, because you were there with him. And obviously, after you were gone, he was still there for a bit. And then they traded him, and he was pissed off. They viewed him as what? A four or a five? And now he is proving to be a one or a two? Like, that is a massive jump in how the world looks at you and how fucking rich you're going to be. Massive jump. I mean, I think you were looking at possibly like a – Five-year, $80 million deal. To me, I don't see why his number isn't in the 170 to 180 now. Wow. More than Rodon. Also, when you say five years, uh, 80, I think there was a time period where it wasn't even at that oh. number for him with the Yankees. You're talking about even after that. I'm saying like when right before he gets traded by the Yankees, if he had hit free agency right at that time, Maybe. Fifty million dollar pitcher, maybe for for three four years, because just of his age and eats innings. Because he was younger, he eats yeah. innings. I mean, I, anybody that eats innings like him, anybody that makes your starts, you're auto, to me, you're automatically an eighty million dollar pitcher. I always use Ian Kennedy as 
an example. The dude just was 30 plus, 30 plus, 30 plus starts a year. Went and got his contract, and I think it was 80, I think it was 80 million at that point. But like you're talking about like doing stuff like Bum Gar- Bumgarner did in his career. So you're you're talking about like he they, nobody has cashed in more in this postseason than him. And now back to foul territory. We'll have Scott Fransky, Phillies play-by-play, coming up in just a sec. Anything from the game that stood out or really the last two games that stood out? And also, just for everyone on here, did a nice, chunky post-game show, about 30 minutes, right after Diamondbacks, Phillies, Game 7. So if you want to check that out for like extensive coverage on that front, including also how the Diamondbacks were built and definitely the heist they pulled off with Gabby Moreno and Lourdes Gurriel. But, I mean... Could the Phillies have done anything differently? Hit. Castellanos to... was 0 for 22. And they were counting on him. After that game one homer, he went 0 for 22. That but don't good. you know what you're getting with him? Like you're going to get that burst to mm. five games where he's hitting a home You'd run. You'd like to game? see no. a little bit more than 0 for 22. Maybe a 2 for 22. Sure. But the homer. Okay. But I, I, listen, no, I, Frazier, I think you agree. Like the Diamondbacks just beat him. They pitched really well. And they beat them. They 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 outplayed them, and they played the last two games especially. They played their their style, which is running and two out hits. Yeah, I want to ask Scott a question when he when he comes on here. Well, let's bring him on now then. Oh, because, right. yeah. Some, sometimes <laughs> people are like, "Oh, the manager made the wrong move here." Rob Thompson's been pretty damn good you know, the last couple of years. Scott Fransky, of Phillies Radio, joining us right now. Scott, how you doing? And why don't you start things off, Todd Father, right after Scott says hello. Hey, go ahead, Hello. Scott. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> hey, what's up, man? So I'm sorry about what happened last night, man. This baseball is a tough sport. We've all been there before. Um, no, my no. question to you is from watching the game, it just seems like from watching the hitters from the, the first four games to the last two, it just seems like they were anxious. They were swinging at a lot of pitches, a lot of balls they were swinging at. And to me, that's not their mojo. Their mojo was seeing pitches, and then when they got that pitch, they would take care of it. And then eventually the last two games, guys were missing those pitches. Do you, do you think there was anything going in a different game plan or anything they had going? Well, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, I heard a little bit what you guys were saying. I mean, the Diamondbacks pitched really well. I mean, you go back and look at some of the sequ- sequences. Um, they didn't miss a lot in the middle. And that, I think that's something that teams like the Phillies do. They're able to capitalize on those misses in the middle. Um, and, um, you know, again – uh, they beat some pretty good pitchers along the way, you know, Spencer Strider included. Um, and he's not a guy who misses uh, a lot, but the Phillies uh, were able to put enough on him. I, I just think, um, you know, there, there's a combination of things. I mean, you got to give the Diamondbacks a little bit of credit. But uh, I do think maybe, you know, as the as the innings started, started to evaporate and the chances started to run dry, uh, I think it's human nature. You you start to tense up a little bit. So um, I know Bryce was pretty close on that one, you know, with the two runners on. But you know, going going into the last game, I, I, and I'm I'm not sure off the top of my head what what last night turned out to be. But going into the last game, he had two at bats with a runner in scoring position in the series. Your your three hole hitter. So I, I mean. He, so he gets one chance to make a difference and he fails and he's he's the one saying I failed my city and all this stuff but they, there just weren't that many chances for him you know what I mean um I thought they pitched him pretty well and uh you know he just had nobody on um Diamondbacks pitched pitched great I thought Francis you losing weight with T-Mac what's the deal bro you're looking tremendous yeah no nah, probably not just uh I haven't eaten in days, right? So is that, just trying is to keep that what up it with is? this schedule. <laughs> is that what it is? It's time I, I roused you out of your nap coming on the show here. Oh, uh, I've, I've made one trip to the elementary school. I've made one trip to the middle school. We had a forgotten violin. We got a kid going in late because he was, you know, staying up late with the Phillies last night. We've got a soccer game this afternoon. It's just back to real life now. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. That's what I was going to ask you. Who is taking this loss the worst? Gus? Loretta, June, or your good friend L.A.? Yeah. Uh, I'd say it hit Gus the hardest. 
um, you know, 13 year old, uh, baseball fan, baseball player. I mean, you know, I, I think it hit, hit, hit him the hardest of all. That's for sure. Not LA. Larry Anderson didn't for anybody who doesn't know who LA is. That's your, it's your Robin to your Batman. He's your Robin. <laughs> Weekends at Larry's. Yes, this is Larry yeah. Anderson is a cult, cult hero in Philadelphia. Was he pissed or was he pissed already in game six? I shouldn't have gotten to this place if they would have just thrown fastballs down and away. Just unbelievable. Well, it worked for the Diamondbacks. Let's be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Fastball down and away and then break off a slider down and a little further away. Yeah, that seemed to be a pretty good formula. Um yeah, you know, he's he's a fan like like everybody in this town. He's a fan of the Phillies. He wants them to do well. And, um, I, you know, I think it's tough, uh, you know, especially, you know, for for broadcasters. We're just riding. Right. We don't we don't have any effect on the outcome. There's nothing we can do. We're just watching. And you're just hoping your team is the one that comes out on top. And uh, it's, it's so rare that it is, right? And and there's nothing you can do about it to affect the, the outcome or anything like that. So, um, yeah, it's frustrating for all of us. That's for sure. Yeah, those are your sense. kids. Gus, Loretta, and June are two twin girls and your 13-year-old son, Gus, an aspiring catcher. He's kind of like a 13-year-old JT Real Muto. <laughs> I don't know about that. Ah, but, come on. Uh, come on. Yeah, I got a, I got a, I got a bone to pick. You know, my son's team lost to uh, Tom's River East in the regional championship this year. Thanks oh, no. a lot, Frazier. Oh yeah. no, man! I'm what? Oh. What age group? Uh, the thirteen U. So. Oh, they were good. They were. They were. They were good. Hey, yeah, Scott, they were good. So, so I'm gonna mix in two opinions for you, and then you okay. tell me, you know, if you agree or you see something differently. So, number one, if if you have to pick someone to blame in the Phillies org for the loss in this series, who would it be for me? I'm going to go to Craig Kimbrell just because those are two games. Like Paul Seawald closed out four games. Craig Kimbrell had two blown saves. I mean, Rob Thompson chose to use him in both of those games. I know he'd been used all year, but back-to-back games, it was, it was tough. So if you're going to blame someone, who would that be? And the second question is, do you think that this was the best chance ever during this run for the Phillies to win a world series. Cause obviously I, we always say this, like your window is now, right. And there's teams sometimes that think their window is going to last for a long time. I think the Phillies are going to be good for a while, but man, it just seemed like they were the best team you know, built to win in this postseason, and it didn't happen. So what are your thoughts on both of those? Well, uh, as far as someone to blame, I mean, this make no mistake. You say what you want about Kimbrell or, or any of the pitchers. This team was built to hit. This built team was built to score a lot of runs, and they got five guys that you know have triple-digit contracts, you know, well over a hundred million, uh, some of them over three hundred million that that didn't perform in this series. So if there's blame to be laid, um, I, I don't think I'm not a guy in baseball that thinks you can lay blame on one person. A baseball game unfolds, and there's a thousand different things that happen along the way, and. And what happens in the first inning can very well have an effect on what happens in the ninth. And I think it's hard sometimes. We all want to point a finger. We all want to assess blame. We always want, you know, someone to someone to pay for it or whatever. But, um, you know, this is a collective effort. They win as a team and they definitely lose as a team. And there are a lot of guys there that, that, that could probably look themselves in the mirror and say, you know what, didn't get it done. And, uh, and, and hopefully that, if they do, they, they sort of acknowledge their part in that because I, I think this is a team that's built to win and three times the Diamondbacks held them two runs or less. Um, they're, they're supposed to score more runs uh, and everybody wants to hang uh, the loss on Kimbrell um, in a 1-1 game because he gives up a run in the bottom of the ninth on the road, right? What about – and what about the winning window? Do you think like – do you think this was the best built team for the playoffs with – what uh, the Phillies I just mean, had. I, I mean that as a compliment. I'm like, I looked at them yeah, and I no, picked them to win I, the World Series. I'm like, this team looks better than everyone else in terms of how they're built. You got your top two starters and even really a three with Suarez and the bullpen's great and the offense great didn't show up. But I'm just like, it's hard to replicate that. You know, guys get hurt, guys leave. We'll see what happens with someone like Nola, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely, 
uh, it, it, that, that opportunity was there. And again, uh, Texas is playing unbelievable right now. And, um, and, and I, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, it's not like if the Phillies had gone to the world series, it's some kind of shoe in. I, I do think, I believe they're a more talented team than Arizona, but Arizona outplayed them. Um, I think the Phillies are a deeper team than Arizona, but Arizona outplayed them and, and they deserve to move on because they played the best. Um, but yeah, I thought the window was there. Um, I, you know, I mean, it, I think a lot of people felt like, hey, if whoever wins that Phillies Braves series probably, you know, should go on to the World Series. But, um, I, you know, that's baseball, right? Um, it, I think it, I think it's an interesting – it's sort of a weird thing about baseball that, um, you know, we build these teams to be good over the long haul, right? But it really comes down to how good you are over seven days or five days or three days, Right. Um, to whether you move on or not, to whether you're a World Series champ. I mean, the Braves are an unbelievable team. I saw them a lot. Um, they're deep. They're talented. But um, <clears throat> they ran out of pitching at the wrong time, right? So they, they're they they're home early, um, even though they won 104 games. And the Dodgers, every year, it seems like, they're home early, even though they win 100 games. Why is that? I, I don't know. We build teams for the long haul. Um, we try to make them good for the long haul, but sometimes um, it's the, the sort of the chaos of the tournament. Um, I almost wonder if you just let all teams in the tournament do it like the NCAA, right? Just have everybody going crazy. <laughs> the what? Yeah. The, the, yeah. They, yeah. Right. I mean, tournament. the Royals get hot at the right time. <laughs> they, they swept the they swept the Astros in two two series. So right. I mean, you never know. know. Sienna, Sienna's never winning the tournament, though. Don't worry about that. They might make some upsets. No, but that's the point, right? Royals upset, uh, you know, Baltimore in the first round, and then, you know, the whole bracket is messed up. And... <laughs> you would love that chaos. You would love that chaos. You, you, sit down, you sit down every day except for Sunday with Topper pregame, and you do your pregame show. I saw it last year when I worked with you. Like, was there any time – you saw the ups and downs throughout the whole season. Was there any time that you ever saw Topper, including this series or before this series, like where he was nervous or trepidatious about his – like what was happening? Because he knows. He knows, and I've told you tons of stories about how he's like – you know, he's so prepared. He almost can like tell you what could happen in the games. Was there any right. times where you saw him nervous? No, I, in fact, he stayed, I mean, he was really positive and, and he was really confident and, you know, even, you know, off mic and behind closed doors, he, he, he remained pretty confident in his team. He was very watchful of, of their mood and their attitudes and, and the way they were handling things in the clubhouse. As you know, Kratz, he's, he's a guy who, who watches people, right? And, and he, he has a, a, tries to have a pretty good sense on what they're feeling and, and, and how that might translate. He felt like they were loose and ready to play and ready to go, um, both you know game six and game seven. I, I think he he had really, again, high hopes that the, 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 it was going to go their way, and uh, they just didn't hit and it didn't go their way. Hey, I want to ask you what you said before about making the, everybody play in the playoffs or whatever it is. So, do you? We've had these conversations on here before. Do you believe five day layoff is that a problem in uh, playoff? Uh, Baseball, are, are you a believer in that? Or are you just saying, you know what, it is what it is. These guys are professionals. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's the five-day layoff. I, I, um, I, there, there must be something they can do to, to better um, – to, to make being the division winner matter more, uh, to make it more of an advantage. I don't know what that is. You know, I've heard some people say, well, you come out of that wild card series and maybe you don't get any time off. You have to roll right into the division series. Maybe you back it up by a day. It's a four day layoff for the division winner. There's no off day for the wild card winner if it goes three games. Maybe that's a way to get uh, get it. You know, th there has to be some sort of of advantage to winning the division. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Right. Uh, otherwise, why are we acting like winning the division is a big deal? Because right now, do you think the Braves think it's a big deal that they won the division or the Dodgers? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's something marketing wise, you can fly that flag and all that. But you didn't win the World Series. And um, I don't know. I don't know how you make it 
uh, more fair. I mean, Todd, you'd obviously be way better qualified to answer whether or not a five-day layoff is is detrimental to the team. Um, the idea, yeah. you know, maybe maybe it is for a hitter. Um, I don't know. For pitching, I would think it's probably beneficial. You line it up the way you want it. Um, you know, they got to do – the Braves technically were going to get to do something they didn't get to do all year, and that's those Strider and Freed twice in five games each, right? So four times in five games. Um, now, I got, didn't get that far, but um, – so have what better advantage do you want than that? I love I love uh, that you're saying this. I love that you're saying this. I completely disagree with you. But I also okay. it it also makes me Well what do you Well what they, is it? What what is Go ahead. I, I just mean what how do you make the division matter? How do you make winning the division matter? Or yeah, or are, you, are we just looking at it in a vacuum of this year's results? Hey. Well, He's and, and over it's it's never happened. Like it's it's never happened where a hundred a hundred win team makes it to the playoffs. So people are even crying more about it. And to me, my thing is just flip it on its head. Let's say right now the Dodgers and Braves get it. And I've asked probably six different people that have been involved with teams that got eliminated that had a hundred wins. And I said, okay. And even Anthopolis came out and said, no, it's not going to happen. Would the Braves and would the Dodgers have said? We'll go play the wild card because we don't want so much rest. That that's what that's what they'd rather do is go no, play the wild. No, they said no. They said no. I don't think anybody would take the wild card game. So that's to me that's the option is to give them the choice. If if that is really detrimental to your hitters, right. give them the choice. Because my also, career Pratt's- shows my <laughs> career shows that five days off of hitting all the time. Makes you a 200 hitter. Pratt's, oh, yeah, <laughs> right. good one. But also, like, Max Fried probably wouldn't have even pitched in the wild card series. The Braves could have gotten bounced in the freaking wild card round if they played in that. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I just don't know how you – I mean, I, I agree with you in the sense that uh, I think the idea of um, – the maybe the division winner needs a, a, a somehow a better home field advantage. Or maybe the, the, the reality is – the division series needs to be longer. Mm. Um, I mean, the whole idea of the division series of winning the division is saying you're the best team. You're the deepest team. You're the best team. So show us, show us how deep and how good you are. Um, and I, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know what the right answer is because the Phillies certainly, you know, you know, they can ride two really good starters, right? Wheeler and Nola. Um, do we want our game to be that way? Um, don't you want to see the full depth of the roster and 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 make teams show you how good they are? Um, I don't know. Maybe that's the real uh, advantage there is if the home team has, you know, the division winner, they're guaranteed a seven-game series where they can fully show off how good they are. Let me ask you this. That's great points on, on all those. I, I love that. Have just maybe just – even have the 10 teams come in and whoever this top team is, say, hey, I want to play this team and and you, you go from there. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, what do the Phillies need to do in the offseason, if anything, uh, to get this team back to, uh, you know, where they need to be again? I kind of think their central first question uh, is to ask Bryce what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. Um I, you know, he was asked in the postseason, are you going to go back to the outfield? Um, because I think there's a lot of dominoes that could fall there, right? If you view him as an outfielder who maybe sometimes plays first base to, you know, you know, rest or sometimes DHs or whatever. Um, but what do you view him as? Are, are you looking at him as your everyday guy at first base? Because, I mean, obviously this year, in the second half, he was. Um and certainly in the playoffs he was. So I think you answer that question first. Um, and then you start deciding what to do from there. Um, I don't know if they're going to sign Aaron Nola. I, I don't know how hard they'll push to sign Aaron Nola. But um, I think October showed just how valuable Aaron is. Um, and and Kratzy knows what an Aaron Nola fan I am. Um, but uh, that that's not an easy guy to replace. Um the, the durability, 
the dependability, um, the pitchability. Uh, to me, he's 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 what you want in a starter today, and I think he's still got plenty more left to go. Um, I don't know what I I'm I'm not a big financial numbers guy in terms of what these these the players make. Um, but I, I can tell you this, it'll be hard to replace him. I don't know where you go to replace him. Um, so I think they could probably, I, I do think, again, you answer the Bryce question, then you, you figure out first base. Is it Reese? Do you try to bring him back on a one-year deal? Um, very popular player. Um, you know, but you know, there's some people, you know, detractors as well who, who would, who would be fine moving on. So, um, I, I don't know. I think you answer the Bryce question, then you see what you want to do with your outfield, but you got to, it's all about pitching. So. Are you ultimately saving money because the team didn't move on to the world series to play in Texas again and all your family come and just bombard you with tickets? Uh, the team is saving nothing. Uh, I'm, no, are I you saving, saving money? A few bucks. Yes. I might be saving a few dollars. Yes. They don't exactly uh, put a big stack of tickets off to the side for the radio announcer. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I would have been pretty limited in the number I could have purchased in the first place. So That's what you were telling everybody. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. It would have been really cool to go there. And uh, that's where I grew up. And that's the, uh, I, I have a, you know, great relationship and a, and a tremendous fondness for Eric Nadell, who's been their voice for years. And he was a big mentor of mine and, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him, uh, in in some measure. So uh, I and I hope he gets to finally call a World Series. And um, you know, I, I wasn't hoping for that 24 hours ago, but now I guess that's that's what that's what hope I'm left with here is that <laughs> that, that the Rangers can win it for Eric. Hey, last thing for me before we let you go. In 2001 or two, I think my brother played for Kane County. Did you uh, ever announce for him at all in those years? What year was he there? It was either 2001 or 2002. I read that you were there in the I early was there 2000. through 2001. So uh, you, I don't yeah, remember. Charlie. Yeah. But all good. Yeah. Um, the, we had some really good teams then. Um, Yo, you, they had some came, squads back then in the minor leagues. Yeah. we we my la The last year I was there in 01, their infield was Adrian Gonzalez at first. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Josh Wilson, who played a long time, he was at second. He was um, good. Yeah, and uh, Miguel Cabrera was the shortstop, and uh, Josh Willingham was the third base. <laughs> and yeah, well, yeah, wow. it was yeah. Dontrell pitching was Beckett was he on was that he team was also too? the next year. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't uh, you, you must. Dontrell yeah, you that. must have missed it. That was that yeah. Year. I missed him. All right. That that's yeah, they had Beckett the oh. year before that, so Josh Beckett was there. Um, yeah, they had some really good players go through there. No doubt. <laughs> Scott, it was it was great to have you on, dude. Um, enjoy the offseason. We'll, we'll see yeah. what the Phils do. And, uh, Let's go and Black, Black you, Rock man. Soccer team today, okay? Black yes, Rock exactly. Soccer. <laughs> sorry tell we beat you. So tell your Don't kid, be sorry, over anxious the like the Phils. Just go have <laughs> yeah, fun right. out there. <laughs> Cheers. Right. See you, Scott. See you, folks. <laughs> Bye. We'll be right back. To get more rest now and i know you're used to working this deep into the year chandler how you doing and what was your take from yesterday were you surprised not just that the astros lost but that they got shellacked um i told someone before the game that i i had absolutely no feeling for how that game was going to go just because i've seen so many different iterations of this astros team show up this year and then the one you got was the Minute Maid Park version of the Astros. Um, it's the most baffling thing that I think I've ever seen. They lost 21 of their last 28 games at Minute Maid Park this season. They lost five playoff. They lost six playoff games in a row at Minute Maid Park. Um, you know they went seven for 58 with runners in scoring position during home playoff games this year. They they looked like a completely different team. It looked like two separate teams when they played at home and when they played on the road. And I don't know that there's a great explanation. You know, they tried to – I mean, the batter's eye was a was a big talking point. They extended it in September. But, I mean, at some point you have to look at the other side and say the Rangers have the same backdrop. The other teams you're playing have the same backdrop. And the Rangers scored 11 runs last night and nine runs the night before. Um, 
you know, as far as last night goes, I, I didn't expect Christian Javier to only get one out. I mean, this is a guy that they talk about. He's called El Reptile, right? He's got the – he's a cold-blooded, kind of slow heartbeat guy. Nothing gets to him. Martin Maldonado, after the game, pretty much acknowledged that he was too amped up, that his velocity was all over the place. He was – he was overthrowing, and you kind of saw how that transpired. Corey Seager hit the fourth pitch of the game, 440 feet, and then that was kind of the harbinger for everything to come. Um, it was, it, it was, it was an inglorious way for a season to end. But I'm not sure it was that surprising because, I mean, the flaws in this team had kind of shown themselves throughout the second half. The pitching had started to regress a little bit. The starting pitching, especially. Knew they had the bullpen advantage, but when you're asking your bullpen to get 26 outs in a game seven, I mean, that, that's just a recipe for disaster, and, and that's pretty much what happened. And now, back to foul territory. Oh, it's good. Back on stadium. Braun Pierzynski, Frazier, Kratz. Your baseball or viral hit of the week definitely got some attention. The league is like cackling about it. Like, whoo, it's great attention for the league. It's so weird. Yep. So so um, MLB employee Chris Russo um, also works for Sirius. And he said this um, a couple games ago about the Diamondbacks. I've been wrong in Arizona from day one. I, I, A, I'm stunned to beat Milwaukee. I thought they'd get swept by the Dodgers. I never thought they'd even go back to Philly for a game six. Uh, I'll try it one more time. I would not be stunned if they won tonight. I would be floored. Floored. And I'll say this right now. Just to, I'll say this right now. And Bob Raceman, write it down. If they win the next two days, they win the next two games and win this series in seven games, if they win, I will I will retire on the spot. Tori Lavello was aware of the comments and said, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, he had some fiery comments too. Like there was a lot more. I watched like, this video where it circulated in Arizona and they were like, if that doesn't pump you up, because it was kind of about how it's us against the world. And this is the prime example, you know, when you have someone who works for the league saying this. So here is the Diamondbacks players post game partying. There you go. All right. So you know what's funny about that is I'm I'm not even kidding, and I can say this because I worked for the league for a while. There are some executives that are like, they love him. Look, this is great attention, and the players <laughs> love it. I'm like, the players turn the television off or like wipe anything out related to that every time. It crushes credibility. It crushes like our sport being modern and cool and fun. Like they literally think it's good for the sport today. They are like texting in group texts, right? Like all the suits being like, look how good this is. This is awesome. It's all about our boy. Did you hear what they said at the end, though? <laughs> retire, loser. That's what the, the part that they need to understand. They said, retire, loser. This, this, this Don't say this. And they're going to say, oh, and well, now he's trying to get out of it by walking through New York in, like, a bikini with, like, I'm a loser. We know you're a loser, mad dog. Go away. Retire, please. Make everyone happy. Just retire, don't, but don't put this out there and say I'm going to retire. And they'd be like, well, I'm just talking about radio. Like, no, you were talking about everything. Retire from MLB Network. Retire from whatever it is else you do, radio, whatever else. If you want to stay on ESPN, fine. Go on ESPN. Great. But get the heck off MLB Network because I'm tired of hearing stories about Joe DiMaggio. Right? <laughs> Players don't go on your show. They go on to talk to Alana Rizzo, not you. Yeah, managers go on because guess what? They have to. <laughs> it's part of their contract. They have to go on MLB Network, and they have to go on with you. But players don't go on with you. So please retire. It's time. You've had a great run. Bye-bye now. They, I, it, this, reminds me, this reminds me of the dude in the games, that the fan that's, like, heckling. And he's like, yeah, you know, you suck. And he turns around and gets, like, high fives from his buddies. That's what they're doing right now. Like, he just heckled. The Diamondbacks, and then he's turning around, getting high fives. Look at look at our four people that have shown up on our show and watched. 
like we've had more Diamondbacks on our show than the Christopher Russo show has. Obviously. Also, I, I thought you had the best idea, Kratz, about what to do. Yeah. We all knew. I mean, I said, my, what did I say? AJ made fun of me. I said, my lock of the year is I'll retire if he retires. I'm here today. Sorry about <laughs> it. Did I not say that? That ruined two of our lives. Exactly. Not <laughs> yeah, but it shows my credibility. Because I feel like I'm I'm way younger and way 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 less wealthy than him. I cannot just retire right now, and I was that confident that he would be doing his job today. That all of this is just BS, and the league is like, oh, we need to figure something out, right? Like, just this donate is your great money for the sport. That no way it. to really exactly don't donate salary. That's a great idea. No. He's not doing anything. Of course not. But I'm it saying it was all like, bullshit. That's the million point. dollar MLB salary you could give to charity that would be sick. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It was all. It was just him popping off like he always does, and then no consequences coming out of it. Oh, he's got to walk again. What I read, he has to walk through Times Joey Square. Joey said that. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Like nobody cares. Nobody. Maybe people in New York care. Maybe Todd cares in Jersey. I don't know. I no, mean, it, no. but I mean, nobody cares that what this, he said something. And one thing you have. And there's, there's Votto. No, but he did do mm-hmm. this. Yeah. I thought he agreed to this. Yeah, he did. He did. He, he agreed. was just saying to, you know, they're, they're making, he that wouldn't, he wouldn't say it said, and, I'm the sign was supposed to say, I'm a douche and correct. he wouldn't do that. It said, I'm a loser or something. Yeah. Well, you're both. So, I mean, you should just, you know, have them both on there, but still like, it, it's such just, I, I hate when people. Listen, if you're going to say something, like the way he said it, like, oh, I'll say it with my chest. I'm so tough. I'm Chris Russo. And then it happens. Bye-bye. As NSYNC says, bye-bye-bye. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> that was solid. I wish you gave a little more tone in that voice. Like, sing it. That would be great. Uh, I mean, I don't want, to, I don't want my, my, you know, my, my boys from NSYNC, you know, my high school guys, <laughs> you know, my high school fellow high school alumni. Of course. He's be, in the NSYNC be, group text. Be calling me and say, like, you know. Another, you butchered Crassy, our song. another name drop, kid. I love name it. drop. That wasn't hey, a that, name drop. That's, that's just facts. No, that's a group <laughs> drop. A group a band drop. drop. Band <laughs> drop. Yeah, sorry. You sorry. live in Hollywood of Florida. Hey, he just listen. Russo just he talks, man. I've never seen a guy talk so much in my life. The guy, he, he, and I, I honestly think this was on purpose, just because they need to get his ratings up or something. I don't know. It worked. It worked, man. You can. If you're going to say, if you're going to talk about, it, especially from this area where you've been working, you've grown up, you scream and yell, you bicker all the time, but you have to go through it, what you say. And if you're not going to do that, yeah, your credibility is gone. It's just all this now, man. I, I feel sorry for him because that's that's just what everybody's going to know him for. It, it, it's kind of silly to say, but he got what he wanted. People are talking about him and that's all MLB wants. That's all they want. So, and. Listen, kudos to him. They got everybody talking about him. That, that's all I give him a congratulations to. Well, that's what the sports media machine has been feeding, right? Like everybody complains about the same, like, five dudes, don't they? Everyone complains about Skip Bayless, and he laughs his ass to the bank. Stephen A. Stephen A. It's the same dudes that just go on, and, you know, they script how they're going to say stuff, and then people talk about it. It's on you, America. It started nobody, with, started with Jim watches, Rome, right? Nobody listens. Started with Jim Rome, right? Was he the first? He was kind of the first. Howard, I guess maybe Howard Stern. It's shock jock stuff. There's yeah, a lot of guys. But Jim Rome was like to. the first sports guy that was like, I'm going to say crazy things. And mm-hmm. then it just kind of has filtered over into a bunch of different other people. And now on the TV, I mean, every time you turn on certain channels on TV about <laughs> sports, it's two guys yelling at each other all the time. It's like, can we just talk? Can we just show highlights like we used to? Now we just have. We have two guys always like – they're two people. It doesn't have to be males, but two people yelling at each other all the time about whatever they're talking about. Like, what happened to just showing the highlights and talking about the game? And, you know, why do we always have to have two differing points of view? Oh, well, because th- I can tell you how that works. They sit in hour-long production meetings, and they're like, all right, this is how you're going to do it, and this is how you're going to – it's all fake. I'm telling you. I mean, we've talked about this, right, where if we're asking you to pick something, like pick a rankings list or – you know, which team made the best offseason moves? Like, we'll have this in the offseason, right? Um, we're always going to, on this show and on this platform, say, just actually pick what you believe in. 
because there are many shows that'll be like, okay, you take this team, you take that team. Like that's fake, but it's acting. That's what it is. And also sometimes you can raise your voice if something really crazy goes on or you're really passionate about something. But if you do it all day, every day, it's boy who cried wolf. So, but again, the core of all of this is people watch and listen and react. And that's why it exists. Because if nobody reacted to it, and it's not even that, it's more if nobody watched, right? If literally nobody watched like Skip Bayless or watched Mad Dog Show or whatever, that's a little different. Nobody does ratings, watch Mad Dog that. Show. That's why so I can't that's use that not, example as well. That's a bad example. <laughs> but I'm saying. Because like, there's not, okay, you, you guys retired after I retired. I retired after 16 and his show was on. I quit. Nobody nobody watched that show. Not Not one player. As soon as that show came on the TV in a clubhouse, you'd find the clubhouse going to be like, dude, put on women's <laughs> freaking finish dog sledding. Anything you could come up with, right? Like any, anything that wasn't that show, you're like, find something else, please. And it was in every single – I mean, at least it was in teams I was on. Yeah, they would flip to – usually I would see it. They'd flip to ESPN. Anything. Yep. Because there's no highlights. There's nothing – there's nothing substantial – about the show. And I think that's the biggest thing from a player's side of it is the gripe of fa- about the fact that he's unaware of what's going on in the game and they piecemeal together a show. And if the players go on, they talk to Alana who has been on the field. She's married to an ex player. Like she has the connection. There's no connection there. That's what ultimately that's what fans want. They want the connection with the players. Isn't he? Isn't he back by MLB? Like MLB and him are like like this now, Scott? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just making sure. I didn't want to sound go off base there, but you're it, talking it, about Mad Dog. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So he, yeah, he best buds with so the right peeps. That's any, how anything he talks about, it has to back up what MLB and Commissioner and all those guys. So that's that's part of his um his mojo, man. That's how what what he goes. That's real talk right there. BSBLR.com and follow them uh, at Baseballer on IG for a lot more of stories like this. Be right back. What do you think will happen? What would you tell Shohei? Because I think for most people, they think he's going to explore other waters because winning is primary and the roster just isn't there right now. So, so what do you think of all this? I think that's what's going to happen. He's going to, he's going to explore the, he should. My God, you, you work very hard to get to this particular juncture in your professional career and the rules are set up for him to do that. So he needs to do that. Um, and he does want to win. Believe me, that's not just lip service. He truly wants to win. Um, the way he, uh, converts, a, as a, as a teammate, he's just so, uh, into every every guy on that team is is touched by Shohei on a daily basis, and when somebody does well, he's right there to revel in their success too. He does. He just wants to win. So I I do believe that. I do believe he's going to go to some to a team that, in his mind's eye, could be an annual contender. Uh, annually get him to the playoffs. Annually give him that opportunity to pitch and hit on the largest stage. So the other point I think that um, I believe is that when he first got over here, he wanted to be on the West Coast because closer to Japan, obviously, and possibly more of a, a culture um, similarities as opposed to different parts of the country. After being through the league several times and after all the success that he's had, I believe that he'll go anywhere. He will, from New York to Toronto to Seattle to San Diego, whatever, he'll go anywhere because I think he's been more Americanized in a sense and he's comfortable with a lot of different things. He knows how this works. He's really sharp. He's really sharp. He doesn't miss a thing, does not miss a thing. Um, and so he'll evaluate it. He'll ask a lot of questions. He'll take his time. He's got great representation. And so I, it's, it really is a coin flip. I just, it's, the money's going to be similar wherever he goes. I think part of it may be the group that wants to, maybe more assurances, whether he's going to pitch or not, whether to go over the top. But there's always going to be that outlier that's going to say, you know what, we're betting that you're going to come back and pitch. We're going to pay us, though, you're going to pitch also next year or there may be some incentives involved, but I think the group that uh, chooses to believe that he's going to come back and pitch, it's going to be the group that's going to get him as long as they have the ability to win, which they more than likely are, because you're not going to pay that kind of dough just to be somewhat um, 
competitive. So, and now back to foul territory. I mean, no surprise on the poll results. First of all, we already just talked about it, but uh, what should Mad Dog do? Retire wins by far. <laughs> Lock of the year. Bet MGM locks. Most of us had a tough day. FT Heaters had a good run. It's It's been above 500. So if you've been following along on MGM when they boost that, great. But we did not do well. AJ was the closest, but Christian Walker's been cold. And that's actually scary for the next round because he, well, he can get hot. I was just thinking at some point he it was like not very good for six games. And I was like, Suarez is starting. He could run into a double early in the game. Yep. But he did drive in the go-ahead run, so – First run of the game, so true. Almost ended with a double play instead. <laughs> but hey, builder's choice. But I did pick the Diamondbacks to win. You yeah, you're a heel. Yeah, it was it was a little bit of a trollish pick. Wait, no, it wasn't. It I was. picked the Diamondbacks to win, and they won. You picked them because Stop. the FT Heater went against them. <laughs> no, it's not why I picked them. <laughs> <laughs> because I picked them because you guys don't involve me in the FT Heater. We did one. We time. totally involved you, and you're yeah. you're so pissy. Don't be so pissy. We'll bring him back in for the next one. No, 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 no. You, hold on. I'm sorry. I know this is quick, but you guys texted me one time and did the heater on a game I was working. I can't bet on that game. I didn't even remember that. I didn't yeah, exactly. That. So All continue right, now. You'll, you'll come back in. And, you and worked on a Tuesday? Don't interrupt me again. Uh, bonus code FAL. Um, four step to get your $1,500 first bet offer. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your new account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Now, what happens in the two days leading up to the World Series, Wednesday and Thursday are off, right? You get news that comes out because the teams are told generally to not make news because let's keep it on the field. And I like that. That's a good idea. So today, for example, we find out Bob Melvin is official that he's going to be managing the Giants. And also, the Red Sox finally found, it's like the Rose, right? Like, they they asked like 8,000 people in The Bachelor or The Bachelorette to take the Rose, and everyone (laughs) said no, and they finally found someone. It actually sounds like it's a good choice. We'll talk to Patrick Mooney about it. He covers the Cubs. Craig Breslow to the Red Sox next. What's up, FT Live Hour Two? Lots of happenings, and we'll start with Craig Breslow leading the front office for the Red Sox in a sec with um, Patrick Mooney, who covers the Cubs. Breslow coming over from the Cubs, but I heard you guys chattering during the uh, during the open there about Craig Council about to get the bag from someone, and it might be the Mets. Did you see Nightingale actually posted the salaries too? There's Andy Martino. Um, who says the Mets have received permission to interview Council for the job, and the Brewers had initially indicated they would not grant it, and Council's contract would have to expire. They changed course. Mets will be interviewing <sighs> soon. Yeah, because the Brewers are probably like, stop stealing all our dates. Stop paying well, more wait, money Wait, what do you mean Nightingale guys. tweeted salaries? He tweeted that Council makes $3.5 million, and even this interview alone is going to push him up to $5 million because if the Brewers want him back, the Mets clearly have interest, and that's 
the market rate for someone like him now. Hey, listen, what did Joe Madden say yesterday about Bob Melvin? If he's interviewing, he's going. Mm -hmm. If they gave permission, he's going. Well, would that stand true here for Craig Council? If he's interviewing and they're granting permission, he gone. <laughs> do you think so? I don't know, but that's what but Joe, Joe Madden knows more about this game <laughs> uh, than I do. But so they granting they're granting permission, Kratz, a few days before the contract ends, and then he wouldn't have needed permission. So it's kind of like, how petty is it to be like, no, you you have to wait until Thursday or whatever. I think. He could still make the decision that he wants to go back to Wisconsin. But regardless, you have to take this interview. He's going to literally make an extra one and a half million dollars per year based on just taking this interview if he does go back to the Brewers. It's not like the Brewers are going to be like, oh, they're offering you five and a half. Uh, well, we're, we're starting at three and a half. Like, obviously, he's not going to stay for that. He's not being paid what he should be paid, market rate. He still has to decide yeah. if he yeah. wants to go. I, think he's, I understand, I, but the Brewers are, don't you think the Brewers are going to have to at least get him up to what, like the upper echelon manager rate is? Yeah, that's not that, that's not that tough. It's an no, Osceola it's not a big that. deal. They're not poor. I Antion, mean, it's a million Antion and a half do dollars. That. He'll it's do that. He's done it. players. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, but now he'll have the leverage. That's, that's a good point, Scott. If they do come at him like, hey, listen, they came at four or five, I, you either put up or shut up, basically. That's it's a good problem to have if, if I'm counsel. And he deserves it. He, has he not been one of the best managers? And it's not always easy to decipher who's good, but it seems like he's been pretty clear-cut doing a great job with a team that sometimes is you know, kind of limited on resources. And also, how often do we look at his moves and say, oh, he screwed up? And even for managers who take dudes out too early, it feels like he actually has that timing down of taking a guy out right before something's going to happen, puts in a reliever, and the game's over. No? No, I agree. Listen, he's one of the best. Players love playing for him. Uh, the biggest question I want to know is, is he going to take Murph with him? That's the biggest question? What, bench coach <clears throat> Pat Murphy? Yeah. Well, if they're going to have to give him the bench coach rate, <laughs> <laughs> what's that? No, I mean, listen. They're going to have to raise him from 200 Craig, to 250. Craig Council is one of the most enjoyable guys to go talk to when you do, go, do managers' meetings. He's been awesome in Milwaukee for, for the time he's been there. He's from there. His family's all there. It's going to be a hard decision. But again, I still go back to what Joe Madden said. If he's taking this interview, he gone. I mean, he might he might prove me wrong. But the fact that he's he, – and obviously there's people pushing behind the scenes too because why would the Brewers say, oh, yeah, look, go ahead and go? Like there's someone, whether it's council's agent, whether it's council, whether someone's in Matt Arnold's ear going, hey, dude, like this is a real possibility. Like. Let's go. I don't know. Different than Bob Melvin's. Different than Bob Melvin's because he's going to be a free agent. Bob Melvin had to go back and manage the <laughs> Padres. So once I think I think it's a different situation. Let's bring in Patrick Mooney. Covers the Cubs for the Athletic, and you can probably see him on other shows and all over the place. Uh, <coughs> does a great job doing it, Patrick. Great to see you. You got the whole crew here today. Um, let's get right into Craig Breslow because first off, is it a done, done deal? And what's he like? I mean, what did you think when the Red Sox opened up their interviews about his chances of actually getting this job? Uh, yes, a done deal. And I think his chances certainly improved. Uh, one as certain executives either withdrew or did not pursue, uh, the opportunity, um, it certainly helps when you have Theo Epstein in your corner. Uh, he's been, as you guys know, kind of a, a kingmaker in, in the baseball industry. And Craig Breslow, once his playing career ended, had options. And he chose the Cubs in part to work for Theo. He did not choose to work for the Yankees uh, or the Red Sox. And I think that while Breslow's definitely, you know, more behind-the-scenes guy with the Cubs. I mean, he was heavily involved in almost every aspect of the operation. So I understand while, you know, people in Boston may be like, didn't this guy just pitch for us a couple of years ago? Like, how is he in this position? Like, he's got this unicorn resume, and he has relationships with ownership. He has a relationship with Sam Kennedy, knows Alex Cora. He knows a lot of those longtime people who are still uh, lurking at Fenway Park. And I think all that added up and created a huge sense of momentum for him. Is this really a job that he wanted? Because 
Craig and I played together, and this is a guy that could do anything because of his unicorn resume that you said. Like, there's a lot of people that turn this job down and not like small name people. Like, it's okay to take a job, but just don't take any job. And this feels like maybe it's any job, or is this really where, where he wanted to go? No, you're right, Eric. This is it. I mean, the Cubs hired him you know, several years ago knowing he would be choosy. They uh, accommodated his desire to continue living in suburban Boston, uh, which meant uh, a lot of flights and Zooms and things like that. But So he was going to leave for just any job. And part of that was he wasn't going to leave to go be the GM there or number two. Like he, in his mind... He's already been doing that for years. So I, I think that gave him a little bit of leverage too, where you know he interviewed for the number one job. And I'd imagine you, know, you can't pitch that long in the big leagues without being insanely competitive. You don't get a degree from Yale without being uh, an extremely uh, you know, high achiever type. Like he obviously wanted to win in this one. And I think... This was one of those few rare opportunities, and you know we'll see what he does with it. Well, I played with Breslow with the Red Sox, so listen, I what do you got? What I you concur got with him? everything that they just talked about. I mean, this is one of my favorite teammates I ever played with. I was there? He did a bunch of charity stuff in the Boston area. He's obviously from the Northeast, you know. Ivy League, as he let us know all the time, he's Mr. Ivy League. You know, even in the no, picture, he's got the sweater it. with the with the Stop with it. the collared shirt and the you know the <laughs> backpack only on one shoulder. You know, he looks he's just Mr. Northeast, and it's I think it's a great fit for the Red Sox, and, and I also think he's going to love it. Like you said, he's he lives in the area, he loves that area. He I think he grew up a Red Sox fan from what he was saying. I mean, he was a great pitcher. He's done everything in the front office that you could possibly do. I think this is a home run hire for the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, AJ, you know that the Cubs organization and the Chicago media would never. Sucks? Wait, what? Wait, so what? I'm sorry. You 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 know the Cubs organization (laughs) and and the Chicago media would never overhype prospects. But I I do think AJ, uh, that uh, Breslow has done a lot in that area for the Cubs that makes it an even easier sell. I think with all of these hires, you never know unless you're hiring Andrew Friedman from the Dodgers, hiring Theodore on the Cubs, maybe David Stearns in New York is that home run hire. But I just think in general, there's a lot of unknowns with any of these guys. I mean, you can look at any sport, whether it's, you know, can a defensive coordinator become a head coach, stuff like that. But I mean, what Breslow did, was significant in terms of like management and getting just an enormous amount of exposure across baseball operations. You know, he's meeting with Jamison Tyone in New York last off season when the Cubs are making uh, a presentation. He's, you know, one of those first or last calls with Jed Hoyer. He's in the room with David Ross when they're discussing, you know, bullpen decisions for that night. Like he obviously is a quick learner, has a ton of aptitude um, but there is a lot of like real world kind of pragmatic experience here that he's going to bring into that job, even if he hasn't run the entire show before. Okay. So I got two for you on him moving from Chicago to Boston. One is more simple. I mean, it's been talked about a lot and just wanted to get any examples from you on how he has changed the pitching development and pitching program and pitching strategy with the Cubs, because I think many Red Sox fans and the owner on down with the Sox are like, yo, we need better pitching and they don't want to necessarily just spend on it in the free agent market. I still think they have like a little bit of buyer's remorse that's affecting how they spend on pitchers based on the Chris Sale contract. So I wanted to get your take on what he can bring to the table there, but then also your take on what he's about to go up against. An ownership group that will blame the head of a front office before basically anything else. They have been just churning through dudes, including Dombrowski, who won a World Series for them. And five minutes later, they were like, see ya. And also the power dynamics. I've read a lot about this and some of it's coming from you, obviously, is like how the and the, the athletic, how the Red Sox have multiple people with says. It sounds like there's a ton of corporate politics going on within the org. 
Um, the manager in Alex Cora wants to be leading our front office someday, so he's got more say than most managers do nowadays. It's, it sounds like a reality show over there. Well, yeah, I mean, Breslow knows, like, if you don't win the World Series, you get fired. And if you win the World Series, you get fired. So <laughs> I think that maybe he's coming in at, at a good time that, you know, someone who worked with Breslow – you know, explained to me today of like, he can be a really strong voice of reason and bring some stability. Like maybe you are coming in at a good time where what Bloom did will help you uh, kind of implement your vision. Maybe after those years of, you know, CBT management and belt tightening, like you kind of let it loose. And I think you probably would add someone, and this is why Breslow was never going to make sense to the GM job, like you hire someone who can fill in those administrative gaps. I mean, I think we all know a lot of these contract offers are just whatever your computer system says anyways. So you hope he comes in, can help with your pitching, um, can talk to ownership uh, at a real level who will know all of those politics that I think you accurately describe and, you know, understands the media market in a very real way. And I think all of those things, you know, doesn't mean it works, but that I have a harder time seeing that he's going to be like totally overwhelmed at this point. Okay. So I want to shift to the Cubs here real fast. Cause I know you talk about him. You wrote this nice article about how they showed an offensive identity. Um, off-season talk, do they, should they go for a bat first or should they go for pitching? Like what, what is the first priority they need to do? And then I'll ask my next question after you answer that. Well, I think you see Cody Bellinger right there. I think that is, you know, a, if it's not the number one priority, it's priority, it's number one A. And I think a lot of that will depend on, uh, you know, whether Scott Boris can work his magic uh, on an owner. Uh, that won't happen in Chicago. That's not how Tom Ricketts runs his team. Uh, but absent that, you know, I expect the, the Cubs to make a really strong push for Bellinger. And, you know, this even kind of goes back to Brezzo. Like, for as much progress as the Cubs have made since the 2021 trade deadline, like, they absolutely collapsed in September. And part of that was their pitching and young talent did not quite step up. And so I think on the pitching side, I would anticipate the Cubs picking up Kyle Hendricks, $16.5 million option. I would expect Marcus Stroman to opt in for $21 million. And when you already have Justin Steele and Jamison Tyone and a lot of interesting young pitchers on the way, Given the price of pitching on the free agent market, I don't know if the Cubs are going to go all out there. They'll certainly be opportunistic. They can make trades. They'll explore those avenues. But I think you got to get, you know, Bellinger plus, whether it's Bellinger and someone else or trading for an equivalent hitter with that type of profile. Uh, I mean, the Cubs need a lot just to get back to their baseline of whatever was 83 wins, and that clearly wasn't enough. Let me, and my next question was going to be about Marcus Stroman. He's got a $21 million player option, which is really nice to have. I mean, those player options that you got to feel good whether you do good or bad at the end of the year. I know you want to do good, but can you see him exploring for maybe like a three year, 35 to 50 range with some other team? But do you see him coming back? Do you see him taking that chance? Well, I guess a lot can change, right? Because in June, Marcus was on. I guess it was still called Twitter back then, but he was tweeting or Xing about a contract extension and he wanted to force that issue. And then uh, he had a blister issue, he had a hip issue, had a rib issue. And, you know, me personally, I think it's hard to see him opting out. Uh, you know, this is someone who you know, had a, Great se last season with the Mets and was, I think, maybe 30 years old at that time and took a three-year deal. Like, I don't know if years later, coming off a really poor second half would 
get that. Maybe he, maybe he does. Maybe he wants to find that out. I would, I just think like there's a real um, chance for success. If he comes back with the Cubs. Like he really likes the coaching staff. He <clears throat> loves pitching at Wrigley Field. Uh, I think they have an under understanding and like kind of they let him do his thing. And he has a good relationship with the fans in Chicago and, and playing at Wrigley and all that. So I think if he does come back, I think, you know, the Cubs would get a really strong year uh, out of him and that he would put himself in a really good position to get that deal that you're talking about, Todd. Who makes Thanks. it to the playoffs first? Red Sox or Cubs? Oof. Uh, I would say the Cubs just because they're in a far easier division. Like, I, I don't know if that's like a – you know, huge vote of confidence uh, in the Cubs. But I don't know, especially if, I don't know, if Council leaves, uh, Stearns is already out the door. Uh, the Brewers pitching uh, window seems to be narrowing. Like, I guess I would say the Cubs, since they were closer this year and should have an easier path to be, what, like the sixth best team in the National League next year? <laughs> that seems like a goal. <laughs> yeah. What so, Patrick? So I, I want to take you now to um, the prospect world with Chicago. Um, we are going to talk to help me out here if I say it wrong. Triantos. I haven't spoken to him yet. James Triantos. Okay, Correct. cool. So uh, Arizona Fall League player. We we talk to a couple of them per week, and uh, James is going to join us. So tell us where he's ranked and how he looks within the system. I mean, I'm at least looking at like where MLB has him. It looks like they have him at nine, although Jordan Wicks is right next to him. He's looked pretty good aside from that last start. So thoughts on him and then also the story out there, you know, obviously that you guys put together at The Athletic about Kyle Schwarber's connection with him. Yeah, I think, Scott, you probably would go back to his draft class, which he reclassified essentially graduated from high school in three years uh he was like a, a two-way guy with a 95 mile an hour fastball obviously he's a, a position player now and, and bouncing around but i think that you know, when the cubs drafted him bought him out of his commitment to north carolina their thinking was or their like best case scenario was this is what the best college hitters in the draft look like in high school so that if they didn't take Triantos at that point and sign him, they thought he would be, you know, much closer towards the top of the first round rather than, I think they got him in maybe the middle of the, the second round. Um, so he's super young, super athletic, um, and kind of the interesting story in terms of Schwarber is uh, Triantos' dad, uh, help has an engineering background. He helped uh, develop this. I think it was a, a system for like air traffic controllers, like kind of a, a data tech space. Uh, so he was very fortunate in that regard and wanted to kind of give back to his community. They live in uh, suburban DC, which is you know obviously a very expensive place, hard to get uh, space for kids to play. And so they built this like awesome like batting cage. Uh, to the point where major league hitters would drop in sometimes. And they uh, developed a relationship with Kevin Long when he was the Nationals hitting coach. And, you know, kind of from there, you know, they meet Schwarber. And Schwarber, as you guys know, is such a great dude that uh, even though the Cubs, you know, just released him uh, because their budgets were cut during COVID, uh, kind of struck up a friendship with this guy. And I think it started before he was even drafted, but, uh, you know, they would text and, you know, Schwarber would send feedback. And the way Schwarber explained it to me was like, he's like, hey, man, if you ever want to come hit, and he just kind of said it, and Triantos immediately was like, okay, when can I come? And they were like throwing out <laughs> dates, and Schwarber's like, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so he went out to uh, Middletown, Ohio there, and uh, I believe it was – last off season obviously he'll give you the full story but that's kind of the broad outlines when he com comes on it's kind of an interesting i mean you guys know about kind of paying it forward and things like that and the really why kyle schwarber you know so beloved in clubhouses is because he he just gets it 
Do you think the Cubs are missing that or they have that? Uh, there was a period there where they were missing it. I think there was a period there where the end of the era uh, from you guys had Joe Madden on from the way his tenure ended to all of those looming uh, contract situations uh, to Theo's eventual exit, like all of that, I think, weighed on it. It went far beyond the World Series hangover to just a ton of uncertainty. And you know, they basically took 2022 to reset, figure out what they have. You know, they discovered that Justin Steele is pretty good. Uh, and I think, you know, last offseason, they made that a point. I think they realized they kind of – part of it was the lockout. Uh, they had to kind of slap a roster together in a very short amount of time. And I, I think – uh, there were certain human elements or like a cohesiveness to the roster that was missing. And I think Dansby Swanson was used, huge in that regard. Uh, Tyone was huge in, in that regard. Um, Nico Horner, Ian Happ kind of maturing uh, into their roles. Like all of that added up to Jan Gomes. Uh, you know, a team that was buried 10 games under in June, uh, you know, clawed their way out of that avoided the south of the trade deadline and you know ultimately they fell short by a game in the end but i think there's a lot there uh to build upon for next year and beyond yeah i was not a believer but i'm glad they did it i mean they gave their fans an extra couple months to root for mm -hmm. so you know it's not like it cost them a ton they didn't have to sacrifice a ton in prospects so patrick appreciate the time dude always love you know checking out your real talk coverage in the athletic so uh, love to have you back sometime, man. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Patrick Mooney. You can uh, read his work in The Athletic. We'll post his Twitter handle on uh, FT Twitter, so you can check him out and follow him for Cubs off-season coverage. And got a lot to get to here before we actually get to Triantos, the Cubs prospect who's crushing Arizona Fall League ball, by the way. Uh, hot corner time. Let's sizzle. So first, a few things popping up about the World Series. And our dedicated FT fan saying they announced Gallons starting game one. Well, mm -hmm. I would say no surprise there. <laughs> that is usually how it goes. Gallon one, Merrill Kelly game two. I bet you they'll they'll put Merrill Kelly game two. It's my other lock. Yeah, and then Fott <laughs> will pitch game three. I mean, game one. Shocker. But yes. That but you know, sense. they're going to have too much time off. Who? Which team? Both. Both. Too much of time off. Of course. Too you much time off. Who do you think? You know what's crazy is the two teams that have more time off, they both won those LCS series. So, no. damn it, I don't know how they did it. No, they should change it. Yeah, they should change the rule. They both Everybody's had one more day off. It's amazing how guys come out of the All-Star break after four days off. They play just fine. I don't know. Man, Everybody's crazy. getting a ring next year. Everybody, yeah, you just need to get trophy. sized at the beginning of the season. you have more than one day off in the whole year, you get a ring. Do you know that either Madison Bumgarner or Bruce Bochy <laughs> will get a ring? Yes, it's true. That's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. They're going against each other. Yeah. Do you think Mad Bums, I mean, he's going to watch, but. Oh, know, he's like, rooting. He's yeah. rooting for AZ so he can oh pick another God. ring? Yeah. He yeah. texted Boch. I know that. He said, I'm available, but he's not. He's not on the team. He tried to do pull the Benji Molina and get the. He was on, remember when Benji Molina was on the yeah. Rangers? Yep, and they played the Giants. And he had he had he had two chances. There, there's been a couple of those instances where somebody's tied to both teams, and it's like, well, you're getting a ring regardless. It's the best way to hedge. Who do you think's favored in the series? Rangers, and in game Rangers. One. The Rangers. Oh, Rangers. Yeah, they are. So for the series right now on BetMGM, minus one seventy five for Texas to win the series, plus one forty five for Arizona. It's not a huge favorite though. No, I mean there's been bigger, but it's it's large. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. sizable. I love the MVP you know, money. That's where that's where I want to look at the MVP money. That's tough though, dude. That's a tough pick. Still, there's mm. there's a lot. I mean, the the easy the the lowest is plus five hundred on Corey Seager. Corey Seager ain't gonna be. They're not gonna throw to Corey Seager. Not right, gonna let so him skipping him. They're gonna skip him. Mm. Okay, fine, good. That's a good call. Fade Corey Seager for your MVP pick. Simeon, he didn't get a hit, and Christian Walker. Neither one of them did much in the LCSs. Or they just keep I think pitching Simeon. to Adolis. Adolis. I think Simeon's yeah. going to be the guy, and that's at plus 1,400. Look at Todd. Todd's already dipping into it. He knows. <laughs> you want my hands come to my chin like this, I'm going <laughs> yep, you're, you're thinking He's about thinking. it. You're like, I could shift some of my 401K, my Vanguard over. 
Stop. I gotta I gotta look into all that stuff still. I don't yeah, know what's do. going on. With it. I'll throw a few other numbers at you. <laughs> so two years ago, these were both 100 loss teams, and then last year, even 88 losses, 94 losses, and this year, 84 wins, 90 wins. So um, if you're a wild card contender, you should you know try because could get hot. You could get hot. Hey, let me so, ask. Let me. Can I ask the guy something? Say the guy comes up and plays in September or just plays for a week or whatever, and then they win the World Series. Do you think he deserves a ring? Hmm. He was part of the team. Yeah. Uh, no, he, I, I'm, I'm not. He helped I'm, you get I there. I, I just, think so. I was just curious what you guys thought. Of it. I agree. I think, so. I, I think if even if you get one day, because I know NBA, I don't think they give the guys a ring unless they play a certain amount of games. That's cheap. It's like it doesn't cost. I mean, it does. It just costs a ring, though. It's not like you're given this – this pile that has scarcity and you can only give out, you know, yeah. 28 no. of them or whatever. That, right. Like what I heard in the NBA, this, I could be wrong, but I remember saying you got to play a certain amount of games to get a ring. If your team wins. Why do you, why do you ask that Todd? Because obviously I, my whole career was coming up for one day. No, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing behind it. I was just thinking out loud because Madison Bumgarner, he, he might get a ring. I mean, listen, it's just crazy. I love it. I think everybody should get a ring if you play, even one, even one game. I think it's. I agree. Yeah, and I obviously stand on that side of it. And yeah, you, you stand on that side, and you stay on that side. Okay. Yeah, I'll stay there. Yeah. All right, two, two, two more bits of of numbers for you that that stood out to me. This one's good. So, do you know that in every series this postseason, besides one, the team that struck out more. On offense, won the series. I told Every you, series, analytics. Except for Houston and Minnesota. Every other series, like just <laughs> like what we had, Arizona struck out 69 times. Yeah. Uh, giggity. Uh, 60 times for Philly. Texas struck out 55 times. Houston struck out 47 times. Does that mean anything? Give me, give me who hit more home runs. Well, that's usually the opposite end. But also, don't those two sometimes tie together? That's the but that's, that's such the a small sample. It's such a small sample size. Well, everything's a small sample yeah, size in the but, playoffs. No. But I'm talking like go through the year. The teams that strike out the least, least usually are there. Now this year is a little bit different because normally, but the Astros or not the Astros? Excuse me, the Rangers. They still put the ball in play. The Diamondbacks put the ball in play. I mean, a fairly good amount. It's not like they're going up there. Every guy's taking gangster hacks and trying to go deep. I mean, they <laughs> put the ball in play and and, and run. So. I mean, yeah, they strike out, but they're also putting the ball in play more than most teams. I don't know the numbers, but I'm assuming it's more than most teams. Um, yes, they were a tough team to strike out during the regular season. The I know Diamondbacks that from, were, right? from betting. What? The Diamondbacks were. Yes. And the Rangers, I don't think, were that big either. I mean. They were mid. They were right on They are mid? Yeah. Okay. They were like. Diamondbacks, they were... Diamondbacks were tough. I, a couple times early in the season on K-Props, I got – beat and then i avoided them the rest of the year i was like nah this team is just making too much contact <laughs> i leaned so. into them and i made cash off of the twins and the mariners oh was, with their case. the twins were the twins were huge giants too yep yeah if you right, just, i got one more because our guest is going to come on soon one diamondback struck out the least this year the least the least yeah but this is what i'm talking about like the you know how it gets very oh wait sorry sorry no, the fourth least. Sorry. Fourth least. It just Guardians, gets very Nationals, one-sided where, like, you get people online going, like, see, strikeouts are good. I'm like, <laughs> okay, relax. And then lastly, because this this one I will I will die on this hill, run differential is garbage. <laughs> the Arizona Diamondbacks were a negative 15 this year. There's only been one team in history that's won the World Series with a negative run differential. 1987, 87, baby. Minnesota Twins. Today's but, the anniversary. They won it. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's such bullshit. It's a different team. Teams change, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's such a long season. I don't care. And also, the amount of times that we see games during the year where it's like, oh, they lost 11-2, and, you know, Kratz was pitching the 8th and the ninth. Like, run differential is just – it's a lazy stat. Sorry. Yeah. That's my take. For predicting you're, you're how right, a team's going to do. You're right, Scott. There's Thank no you, way Kratz. that run run differential means anything. It doesn't. Oh, oh, oh. That was a Thank you. Spot. All so, right, let's bring on our guest. See what he thinks about run differential. Exactly. Our it perfect game there. player of the week right now, James mm -hmm. Triantos. 
We just Ooh. talked about him with Patrick Mooney, one of the Cubs' best prospects, who had a great year in the minors and now is carrying that into the Arizona Fall League, joining us from out there. James, how you how doing, man? Going, guys? How are we doing, guys? Good. You got the whole crew today. <laughs> How's Arizona life treating you? Uh, it's great. You know, weather's great. Still getting to play baseball every single day. Um, I'm loving it. So, having a lot of fun. Where are you at in the season? Um, like how, how has it been kind of playing with other players that you're going to go up against too? Have you ever had a chance to do that to this extent? Right. Cause like you're a pro player now you're getting paid to play ball and you're on a team with other great prospects that someday you're going to you know, snarl at. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's really cool. Um, you know, just to be able to learn from all these guys, um, everybody has a different process. Um, you know, especially, you know, coming from different teams, different organizations, everybody goes about their business differently. So it's nice to be able to see, um, you know, what everybody's doing, what works for people, what doesn't work for people. Just, you know, being like a sponge, soaking up information. Um, it's pretty cool. Who would you say, um, you know, well, let me ask you this. Who, who did you look up to as a hitter uh, when you grew up and who would you compare yourself to right now? <sighs> Um, I'd say biggest person I look, I was looking up to is, uh, Kyle Schwarber. Um, but right now I would, I want to compare myself to Luis Arise, I'd say, because I don't, I don't strike out that much. I feel like I hit a lot of line drives, um, and I'm just going to drive the ball in the gap consistently. So, um, I don't know if I have that power to hit the ball 115 miles an hour like Schwarber. But, um, <laughs> you know, maybe one day. But um, for right now, I'd, I'd like to be like Luis Arras. Hey, uh, well, oh, hold man. on, Kratzy, because he brought up Scott's favorite player of all time. Yep. So, James, thank you so much. Because Scott just got so happy you brought up Luis Arras. No, he has the biggest man crush on Luis Arras of it, all time. AJ can't stand Arras because he doesn't like that. Guys is not. That Oh, wow. change the complexion wow. of it you mean that was my whole career? All you say is like, oh, Make the contact. Twins ripped off the oh, Marlins. That's not what I said. Sorry, Lopez. James. We had to, sorry. There's he has a man crush on Luis Arise. It's right. his favorite it's player. Sorry, so I like Thank you very much, that Scott says. contact consistently and are not an easy out in the lineup <laughs> like the dude I'm sitting next to. Ooh. You should. He should be your favorite player. No. I, no. All right, let's get back to the prospect. <laughs> here, okay, yeah, let's get back to the prospect. Okay, no, go ahead, Kratz. I just think AJ should love Luis Arise. I love I Luis Arise. He throws the comp out there. Go ahead, Kratz. What I was going to ask was, have you gotten blowback from coaches saying, like, if you talk to a coach in the Cubs organization and you said, "Hey, I kind of like watching this stuff that Arise is doing," and and you know, this is what I want to do, or, and they're like. Uh, look, you got to hit dingers if you want to make it to the big leagues. Do you get blowback from that? And is that tough to handle? Um, I mean, it's not like I'm going up there not trying to hit it, you know, not trying to hit home runs, but like, um, I'm going to go up there and stay within my approach. And if the ball goes out, the ball goes out. Cause usually when I try to hit home runs, they don't come. But when I stick, you know, stay within my plan going up there, that's when good results happen. And I, you know, I've helped um, develop this plan throughout the whole season. And I've talked about it with a bunch of hit, with my hitting coaches here. Um, and it's not like something I've just done on my own. So other people, other people have helped me. Um, and I, I haven't, I haven't gotten any blowback from it. It's because it's not like I'm just going up there trying to tap the ball. I want to do damage. But like, you know, when I when I do damage right now, if I hit it real hard, it's going to hit the base of the wall in right center, and it's going to go ten feet over the wall in left center. And I feel like that's an off season thing if I want to work on power. But right now, just sticking within the approach is the most important thing for me. Um, and I feel like I've been on the same page with just about every hitting coach I've talked to. So that's always, you know, it's always a good thing. James, what do you think of? The rule changes so far that have now carried into the big leagues and, and what, you know, people around you have said, like your peers, you know, in the Cubs org or at the fall league, because I'll use the example right now, playing off what you just said, the Diamondbacks had 
you know, some pop in some of these series, especially the, the Dodgers series, but that's not a home run hitting team. Their GM says that their manager says that, you know, they're lower echelon in terms of home run hitting. We just talked about how during yeah. the regular season, super tough to strike them out. And they're playing a brand of baseball embrace chaos. They call it that seems to be fitting towards the way the game is trending, which always happens, right? The game kind of yeah. goes through trends and teams try to kind of zig where other teams zag. So do you, do you guys talk about that and how you can mold your game to the way modern baseball is now changing again? Um, I mean, I'd say, I'd say I like to go, go out there and do what I do best. Um, and good things are going to happen. Just watching the Diamondbacks play they're you know, they're just grinding it out. They're doing everything right. They're, uh, taking advantage of all the mistakes the Phillies made. Um, you know, it was, it was fun to watch. Um, I grew up a Phillies fan, so it was hard to watch. But, um, you know, they're just doing things right. Um, and I can't, you know, they earned it. That was that was a great series to watch. So, um, but, yeah. Wait, did you, get as mad, did you get as mad as Kratz did last night when they lost? No, I was actually in the middle of, in the middle of a game, and I just heard the crowd. Everybody saying the Diamondbacks won, and I was like, "Oh man, that's uh, that's <laughs> tough." <laughs> so, how long but, did you how long did you live outside of Philly? So I've lived I lived in uh, Northern Virginia, right near yeah. DC, my whole life. Mm -hmm. But both of my parents are from New Jersey. Um, my dad's from South Jersey, so he's been a Phillies fan his his whole life. That's how I was raised. Um, that's just uh, where it came from. So hey, let, let me ask you this, bro. Having two parents from Jersey, I mean, respect for one. That's Stop. unbelievable. Do you mm -hmm. feel like sometimes you go out there, you got a little chip on your shoulder, man. You go out there and go out there and dominate and show those boys what's up from the Northeast? <laughs> I mean, I'm really just just focused on going out there and doing what I do best. That's uh, that's it. If I go out there and do, do what I do, then, you know, good things will happen. Uh, it's just stay, staying focused in the moment, really. I mean, I, I now figured it out. We only have people from Phil, from Pennsylvania and New Jersey on. That's it. Like, when can, can we get some Florida dudes on here? What, All those, just for everything. Like, we, we have plenty of dudes. Can we get from some Florida, Florida dudes on here? That's, Every that's player best, that's ever t that's ever even been to Orlando has been on this show. Well, I mean, they usually James, work out. Yeah, James, Florida guys. Florida guys don't have that hunger because they grew up. Oh in my the God! You're right. Exactly. Because right, we're exactly. just better. We don't need exactly. that hunger. We're just yeah, better. You don't, you don't need the hunger. You just are, you're just not hungry. We're just so better. Like, we're just man, better. Just, everybody just needs to give us trophies and stuff. The northern yeah. northeast guys. Oh, exactly. We're, uh, sorry, we're, we're earning that. Well, grind it out. Grind it. Do you hear what you hear the word he used? Grinding it out. Thank exactly. you. In the cold. Well, also, Thank you. I mean, this, wait, since, this, wait, hold on. Since I was born in New York, does that make me automatically a grinder? So gr I'm you, a grinder. So that's why you're a heel. <laughs> that's why you're a heel. <laughs> well, also, I mean, the only real part of this is that if you are a serious baseball player in the Northeast, you're not playing outside as much. I mean, you can, there's indoor facilities, yeah, of course. But, but it's different, right? It's not just like, oh, it's December 10th. Like, hey, I'm, I'm suddenly like I'm back from school and uh, practice is over if we're inside and I'm going to go play outside for two hours. Like, that's not a mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not if it's no, 10 it's degrees and it's snowing. Yeah. Did, you, did you play other sports besides baseball? Um, I played, I played basketball and football when I was younger. So okay. I played basketball longer than football. Okay. Yeah. I, I did the same thing. I played football until my freshman year and I said, you know what, <laughs> it's going to be basketball to get ready basically for baseball. Um, mm -hmm. as the years went on. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I broke my collarbone in eighth grade when I was playing football. So that was you know, about it. Easy, easy <laughs> decision for it. you. Yeah, yeah. 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 For sure. James, we keep we keep receipts on this show. We love having younger players on, veterans, guys that are just retiring. Now mm -hmm. we're going to keep this. We're going to keep this. It's going to be archived. What's a successful okay. career for you? What's a successful big league career for you? I know right now you want to have your approach and get to the big leagues, but what is a <laughs> successful career by the time you're 40, year old, 40 years old and you're retired? Uh, I mean, I want to – I want to be up there for a while and win for as long as I can. That's that's my goal. I want to play for you know whoever 
you know, I want to I play for a long time and I want to go and win a lot because I love winning. That's, that's my favorite thing to do. So winning and competing, my two things. So keep it simple. That's, uh, as long as the game, as long as the game will let me play, that's uh, just go up there and win. Nice. So, so James, a big part of that is how the rest of the crew is looking in the minors, right? Because you're going to come up with this whole class of young Cubs. So, can you give me some scouting reports on who else you've been playing with? Um, in the system, who you're friends with, and also like who who looks impressive, right? Like who stands out hitting, pitching, who's improved a lot? Because um, you're living that right now, day to day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, first guy is on my team here, Kevin Alcantara. He's a freak. He can run faster than everybody, jump higher than everybody, throw the ball harder than everybody, hit the ball harder than everybody. He's unbelievable. Like he can do it all. Um, I've been playing with him since we were in the ACL together. So I've seen, you know, I've seen it for a while and uh, I know he's going to be, he's going to be a great player for, for a long time. Um, the next guy is, uh, I'd say is BJ Murray. He's a, uh, switch hitting infielder. He's, he's the man. He rakes, he plays great defense. He's always, um, under control. He's like, Always calm, cool, in the moment. Um, I've learned a lot from him. Just being able to, you know, keep his cool, keep doing what he does, even when things are spiraling, spiraling around him. Um, he's just, he's just a great baseball player. He does things right, um, and it's been fun to learn from him the past couple of years. And then another guy who uh, is really good is Owen Casey. He's I've never seen a, somebody hit the ball so hard. It's it's unbelievable. Um, hitting balls at like 117 once a week. I, I don't get how I don't get how people do it. But he's a, he's a great hitter. He's unbelievably mature for his age. Um, and I know he's going to be really good in the big leagues. So those are those are my three guys. And then a pitcher would be Kate Horton. His stuff is just gross. He throws 98. He's got a great slider. Great curveball, good changeup, throws everything for strikes, can put everything where he wants. I think he's going to keep dominating. He dominated everybody this year. So I think he's going to continue to do so. Wow. Really good. Really good scouting report there. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Eric brings up stuff about receipts. I'd like to give you a little word of advice. When you talk to these pitchers that you'll probably have to face moving mm -hmm. up, just, just ask him, hey, man, what would you – how would you pitch to me? And then, you know, <laughs> as they get older and older, then eventually you play against them. It's like, I, I try to remember what he said against me. I always yeah. used to do that. And especially yeah. you're in the big leagues too, because you're going to face guys that you've played with a lot, but they're going to get traded. You're like, hey, man, how would you pitch to me? I'm struggling. Just make something yeah. up. Like, hey, I'm having a tough time right now. You, How would you pitch to me? Boom. You'll have that guy sure. perfectly. For sure. Get one, uh, get one pitch, cheat it, cheat it real quick. Yeah, why not? Every once in a while. Good stuff. I didn't it's know that top five. You pull the okie doke on your teammates. You're like, oh, okay, okay. Always. I'll I was see always you in trying a couple to, years. <laughs> always trying to find the upper hand. You know that. <laughs> I like it. Well, James, it was awesome talking to you, man. Uh, good luck. Finish strong there. Enjoy the off season, and uh, we'll see you in the big soon. All right. Yes, sir, guys. I, I appreciate. It. Thank you guys for having me on. Thank you. Yeah, it was great talking to you, um, James Triantos, uh, Cubs prospect. Twenty years old too. I mean. Mm -hmm. Young prospect thriving in a cub system, which he gave a great scouting report of. That's gotten a lot better on both sides. What you can't? No, they they are. They've gotten better. They're they're on the up. Yeah, they are. They're the Cubs are on the up. They're in better shape right now than the White Sox. Right, they're on the up. I mean, they almost yeah. made the playoffs this year. They missed by a game. They got money to spend. They'll spend it. Mm -hmm. They'll and they got farm system coming. I mean, I think everyone in Chicago trusts David Ross. Probably more than they trust Pedro Grafol at this point, right? Yep. Yeah. They probably trust Jed Hoyer more than they trust Chris Getz at this point. Correct. I mean. They're in a better position. And. Both teams play in divisions where you can, like, very quickly rise, dominate, and make a playoff spot, you know? Mm -hmm. These are not powerhouse divisions. Like, to me, the one thing that's been clear cut for the past several years, this year was obvious, too, is that the central divisions are a step below. In the regular season, 
So that's a good thing if you're a team there because you can rise quickly. Like you don't have to go through a five-year rebuild in the AL or NL Central. Do you if, agree? Not if you're smart about it. Right. It's just not it's if you make ridiculous. the right moves. Yeah. Okay. But GMs love rebuilds. We've talked about this. Because it buys them time. It does. It buys, really them, buys time. them time and efficiency and all of that. It's so tired. And my people and my prospects and my players and my yada yada. My manager. My wins. How about until, my wins? Until I screw over that manager and bring in another bring in the one. the next one, yeah. Which brings reason. us to On the Move. So Bob Melvin is officially joining the San Francisco Giants to be their skipper. The Padres did not receive compensation for Bob Melvin's move over to SF, according to Far Anxiety. Also, I was looking, obviously, the show was going on during the press conference, but it sounded like, to paraphrase, he was saying, like, it was good for me to get out of what was going on there, you know? Like, he kind of referenced, like, there's a lot of drama going on there, and he doesn't seem like a heavy drama guy. Oh. I've been around Bob a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like, the reason that he's been respected, I think, is, yeah, sure, he's done a great job on the field with those A's teams, always winning walk-offs and one-run games, and obviously that didn't happen this year. But also just not a yeller, not not a super controversial behind-the-scenes dude. Is that accurate? You know, it's it's not a guy that's going to, like, ruffle feathers in an mm-hmm. org. So when you read an article that is kind of pitting him against the GM, you're like, eh, I'm going to go with his side on this one because he's gotten along with a lot of people for a long time. Have you ever talked to him much? <laughs> right. Yeah, true. Correct. Have you talked to him much? Yes. Bob? Bob? Yes, a lot. Yeah, he's great. When you, I mean, he's Way very back California. He's but like very smart. when you talk to him, like in those manager meetings. Though he does, he he's not he's not super comfortable in there. Not meaning not meaning in a bad way. No, he, it's not a kickback and chill set. No, it's yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get what out what I need out and move on, which is great. He's fine, but he when you talk to the players that he has, those players respect him, like him, most of them. I mean, all most of the ones I've talked to about him, he does a great job. And listen, sometimes things don't work, and the San Diego thing for him, it just didn't work. Now he gets to go back to where he's from, the Bay Area, former Giants player. Once a Giant, always a Giant. Here but we go. It worked. I mean, they made they were what two games from making the World Series last year. This year it didn't work. I'm talking about this year. Oh. Yeah, but I'm talking like about this year, how quickly we forget. Like Buck Showalter, he gone, hundred plus win season. Padres, he gone. They were two two wins away from making the World Series. Like, I just I feel like you need a longer leash than that. But I guess, you know, in this case, there's there's more going on behind the scenes. But I just think it's something that. So did he have good rapport with the players, and then or with with uh, not with the players with Preller last year, and then now this year Preller is like. Oh, this is you know what you did last year wasn't enough. That's I just want to know where it comes from. I want to know where where that disconnect is. If if there was a disconnect that we it was between Preller and Melvin. Yeah, well, there was mo- no, numerous reports. I thought I saw yeah, where they didn't speak or talk for a while there at the end. So I'm saying like when did the it, last when month did it, of the year? I think when did it go? So there wrong? was a clear disconnect. When did it sour? Like what happened? You know, I think. I mean, Preller maybe trying to give him lineups, and the, and Melvin's like, "Screw you, dude." I don't know. But like, no was he really giving him the lineups that. last year? That that would be my question. Is like, where did it go wrong? Because if we never get this kind of stuff out, and I'm not saying that we need to have it out on this show, but like, if it never comes out, how can other teams not improve or not do the same issues? But also the Padres, whoever the next manager, I hope it's Flaherty and not Schilt. Because I think he has that younger connection with the players, but how does he like? How does he learn from this situation? To me, I'm. It's kind of like what Joe Madden said yesterday. If you're not learning from situations, if you're not having discussions, like you got to be able to have discussions. If you're going to give me the lineup, and I think your lineup is trash, I need to be able to tell you, look, this is why this is trash. I think this guy, while his ego says he should hit here, his bat says he should hit here. And if you can't have that discussion with the man, with the general manager or the general manager to the manager, then your team is going to be defunct. And that goes into it. It permeates into the players. Crowds for manager. <laughs> I'm going to say this. Okay. <laughs> bold, bold take. That's probably not that bold. It goes way. It was a good example, but I think it, it went way deeper than just 
bickering over the lineup. And Preller was asked about it, obviously, after all those reports and articles came out. And was just like, yeah, you know, like, you're going to debate when you're going back and forth. Which, that's fine, right? I think it went deeper, like, reading about the dude who he hired, who like everyone called a spy, right? If you're the manager and players are like, yo, I don't want this guy around, that starts to affect a lot of shit. And the manager is responsible for that. And if he's going to the GM and being like, I don't want this, you know, what was he like a military guy or something? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about, right? Yeah. I'm just using that. Like that to me is like a deeper, more dramatic example of something going on where you're like, yo, this is affecting my players. Like get this, that get this dude out of my clubhouse. I don't want him. If he's in your org, he's in your office, right? This is not for me. I've been around the game a while. I don't understand this. People are saying he's like a spy. And if AJ Preller is like, nah, then you're going to have a problem. And that's like a season long problem. That's not like, yo, we need to put him sixth right now, not fourth. To me, that's like a good, let's have a debate about it. And let's see what happens. The Australian dude. You're talking about the Australian dude he brought in. Yeah, was I'm like, using him as an example because yeah. there were about five of those examples about like micromanaging and doing weird shit that you don't see in other orgs. This happens a lot, right? And this gets brought out on this show sometimes. When an organization does something that no other organizations are doing, usually it's a bad thing, not a good thing. Because if other orgs are doing it, it means it's good, it's working, it's accepted, right? If you're finding out about something that no other org does, it's usually not great. Pirates doing, you know, military drills in spring training, probably not great. No one else is doing it. And this is another example of that in my mind. I hadn't heard of a story like that before. But that would be my argument is like, what what is happening? And if Preller really wants to, if he really wants to win, if his true goal, and I truly believe it is, based on like the moves he makes and he's tried, when I was there, he tried and failed with the whole Kimbrel and Matt Kemp and Everybody that was brought in and sent out, uh, I think BJ Upton or Melvin at that time was was in there too. Like, if he really wants to win, he's got to be able to check himself. He's got to be able to have somebody in his life that's like, dude, like AJ, like relax. Like every AJ needs somebody to tell them and put them in their place. Every AJ I've ever met in my entire life, every time AJs need somebody in their life to make sure they're in line. AJ every Ellis agent. needs one? <laughs> every AJ. Uh, every AJ. AJ Foyt? Every one AJ of them. Feely? Every I never AJ. met AJ Feely. Foyt. I so met AJ Feely. Feely. Never. He needed, he every needed AJ. Someone to check. He needed AJ somebody. Styles? I didn't, never met him. Is that the guy from Othello? No, it's a guy from the WWE. Uh, AJ Burnett. AJ Burnett? He needed Burnett. somebody. AJ's yeah, yeah, a guy. He needed oh, he, somebody. He's a beast. I love All him. AJ's. Yeah. It's just a He's thing. coming up on Legends territory, by the way, and it was Fucking awesome. He's moving right right across the way. Yeah, his neighbor. What? We'll bring him in. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Building a house. Yeah. <sighs> might be so might nice. join the FT fam. Who knows? All right. One other thing to get to before we slap hands at the end. So the Yankees are still figuring out what's going on with their management and coaching staff and all that, right? So they announced Boone's back. I thought that they actually announced Casey was offered to come back, but he said on his pod. Quote, I'm not going to be able to come back next year as Yankees hitting coach because I have my two daughters at home. I think getting divorced a few years ago, I have those girls 50% of the time. I just can't imagine being away for eight months. I've known Case for years. That's real. And also, I, I give him credit because some people don't want to go deep into the personal life. And I would say also he probably feels like he owes it to Yankee fans to just kind of take them behind the curtain. Like, that's, that's real. Regardless of what you think about how the coaching staff should look, I mean – He's made money. He doesn't, it's not a high paying job anyway. He doesn't need it. He's, he's tight with Booney and probably wants to help him out. But he's also like, yo, I want, I want family time. I've had a difficult situation behind the scenes. So no thanks. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. He's earned enough money. He's earned it right. You can always slide right back into your old spot on MLB network and start doing that again. Uh, he wouldn't want my exact spot. I promise you. Well, he won't. He won't uh, <laughs> a, a spot. How's yeah, that? Yeah. Different spot. My okay. Spot but was, yeah, listen, good for case. And, uh, I'm happy that he, he got to try it. He probably didn't like it. I mean, it's hard. Like, I remember the old George Brett story in Kansas City. He tried to be the hitting coach. He was a hitting coach for about a week, and he's like, yeah, no, the same for me. Uh, <laughs> it's too much. I actually have to, like, work. And... First one there, right? One of the first people Yeah, there. you got to be there early. You got to work, man. It's a lot of work. You can't just be George Brett. I mean, you got to put in some time with the boys. Is hitting coach more time-consuming than manager? No. No? Uh, hitting coach is, 
different. Many hitting coaches, you know when it, you know when you find a good hitting coach you used to at the hotel bar after the game. <laughs> that was when you knew if you had a good hitting Seriously. coach or not. Seriously. Because he would sit there with you and talk to you and tell you how good you were, even though you're like, God, I'm over 25. Oh, I suck. He'd be like, no, oh, you're good. You're good. Have another beer. You're good. <laughs> the psychology. Yeah. I'm serious. That's what they are. They're psychologists more yes. than they are coaches, really. But they help. I mean. No, some... they do help, but it's more. If you're at the major league level, Frage, you can hit usually. Like, you have, you can, you have some skill, right? The, the hitting coach at the big league level is how do I get this person to mind right every game? And their mechanics, whatever, whatever the fuck you want to do. At the end of the day, it's about can I get my hand, my head, these guys' heads right, and have an approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. And it's you know you they have their routines already, and it's just a matter of honing that routine and making them understand that. Listen, you can change a little bit too, as well. Not you know drastically, but as well. Like they're they're there to talk to. Those are the dugout sessions that you know you have after you're in a bat, you struggle, and you're standing there. You're like, what do you got? You know, and and they're like, yo, dude, listen you're not seeing the ball or you're swinging a bed, whatever it is you're doing. But those dugout sessions with the hitting coaches, I mean, those go so much more than hitting in the cage to me at least because that's where they got your mind right and they understood and told you, bro, you're a good player. You're just going through some shit, man. Don't worry about it. So for me, yeah, hitting coach, you know, they talk about who's your oh, your favorite coach you ever have. You know, everybody's like, oh, who's your favorite manager? And I always, I always tell my favorite manager, but at the same time, I tell my favorite hitting coaches too. Those were the guys. Those are your boys. So – to have a good hitting coach and a guy you can rely on that looks at film day in and day out and sees what you do every day, there's nothing better. They definitely – you definitely know – you might not realize you have a good hitting coach at different points in your career until you have a bad hitting coach. Yeah, <laughs> true. Then you're like, oh, wait a minute. What Kenny was telling me, that's legit. Like, I didn't realize. Like, I knew he wasn't bad, but I also was kind of, you know, you're kind of in that like selfish realm where you're like, I just do it myself. And then you have a hitting coach who's standing at first base and you hit a ground ball and he does everything he can not to look at you as you're walking by <laughs> or you swing and miss and you like glance down at first and he's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. kidding me? I had, a hitting, I had a hitting coach that was asleep, asleep before games when everyone else is out in the cage. And this is before you had like nine assistant hitting coaches. Like this dude was like this daily, every day. Major league hitting coach sleeping. I'm not going to say. No, I know, but because that's people could people wild. Yeah, crazy. Do, do it, Wait, so do who it. who who replaces Sean Casey besides Kratz? After Kratz is top of the Kratz list, is way too expensive for a hitting coach job. Oh. He's got, he's got but Kratz, see, here's what I've, one thing I have learned, though, about hit, most hitting coaches. <laughs> the ones that were great hitters weren't that good at, weren't that that good good at hitting. Coach. Yeah. That's why Kratz would make a perfect hitting coach, because he wasn't that great oh, at hitting. It's the same Ooh. on interviews. When you talk to, like, Miguel Cabrera, he's like, well, I just see the ball and hit the ball. That's how you do it. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll tell my 14-year-old that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I played with two of the greatest hitters of all time. And you ask them, like, Barry Bonds and Ken Griffey Jr. And Manny, throw Manny in there, too. Manny's a, Manny had a little more. But you talk to those other two, and you're like, "How do you do?" And they're like, "Griffey would be like, see the little guy on the end of the bat, just hit that, hit, take the guy to the ball, and you hit it." I'm like, "That's it?" And he's like, "Yeah, you don't have a guy on your bat, so you can't do it." That's insane. That little swingman guy, he had it on his bat. He'd, swing, he'd be like, "Just have him hit the ball," and I'm like, "That's that's what you're telling me." He's like, "Well, you don't have one, so it won't work for you." I have your, your hitting coach for you, Adam Lind, New York Yankees hitting coach. Hmm. What about? I mean, there's some good, in, you know. Paul O'Neill. Yeah, but now you're just bringing up like vets that are names. Yeah, well, that's no, no, no. Adam Lynn. Adam Lynn that... spent the last three years learning Spanish. He got his Spanish degree. He never spoke any Spanish when we played together. Now he he wanted to get his Spanish degree so he can help out the Latin players. Absolute connection, dude. Love it. Adam I... Lind over Paul O'Neill and every like veteran Yankee that yes. you're gonna bring up. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, I want to, I want to, I want a grinder. I want a bilingual guy who's gonna be there all day and night. Perfect name. What starts with an A? No, Very you don't good. need an arrogant hitting coach. Just like you don't need an arrogant manager. Ooh. You can't have you can't have A Rod as a hitting coach. You can't have oh, Gabe it. Kapler as a manager. <laughs> Stop it. Also, one other Chill part, it, too, because hey. Yankee fans oh, are looking for changes and they're pissed off. Like, this is not what's making or breaking the team right now. It's <laughs> roster construction. So don't go too hard what? on this. Like, we have a Yankee think, guy. Let, 
Let Todd give his idea who should be the hitting coach. I know, can't, also, just like Todd, you can't I talk think, about the White Sox. I, no, I you would, can totally talk about it. I'm just saying, Todd, like we don't we don't talk about like who the Mariners hitting coach should be. Like I, I think things get micro micro looked at with the Yankees, but like really let's course. focus on the you're roster right. construction right, right now because that's the problem. Right. If if I had to pick one, it would off the bat, I would say Chili Davis, and I know one's not going to agree with me on there, of course. I had him with the Mets, and I thought he was absolute solid hitting coach. He went above and beyond. He's a guy that's going to tell you the truth. And if you don't like it, you know, some people might not like it, but he's going to make sure that he gets his point across, and he knows his stuff. He picks up pitches from pitchers, and he has great meetings. I mean, that's the guy first and foremost. And then you got to worry about who we're bringing back and who, and who you're keeping and who you're not. So there's a lot. You're right. It is micromanaged because it's the Yankees. I don't know why everybody's like, it's the Yankees. Yeah, well, everybody talks about the Yankees. The one thing I would say also is have multiple. There's the, Half the teams have multiple hitting coaches, like two or three, and it, it gets rid of or at least minimizes some of what just happened here. Oh, I don't like him, but I like him, so I'll just ignore well, him. Well, here's my thing. You know who started oh, having more than one hitting coach? The White Sox? Hawk Harrelson when he was GM. He had a power hitting coach and a singles hitting coach. Did he really? True story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> True story. Wow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Where that does was that one of my. From? That is unique. That first, was one of first, my one of my job offers when I when I got done. I won't say what team it was, but one of my job oh, offers. That, you you like got to say every. You got to say who you're talking the third about. Third hitting coach. Well, that's the singles hitting coach. <laughs> that's better I mean, than being the fourth no, hitting coach. No, you were the pinch hitter. I was a coach. strikeout coach. No, Everybody that strikes out, I go and talk to them and be like, hey, man, I get it, bro. I get it. Well, some teams are into that, and then you could show them the, the playoff numbers. Hey, look, I mean, most teams that strike out more in the playoffs this year. That, so was, def- mind, dude. that was definitely the Brewers, by the way. That was definitely the Brewers. <laughs> it was definitely not the Brewers. All right, uh, boys. All right let's slap Byron. hands. Yankees. Mets. <laughs> you have something for us? First? I have two things. First of all, I found this great video of Kratz last night when the Phillies lost. Watch how happy he is. Can we run the video? Oh. Oh. But you know what, Kratz? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, they that's... smashed the TV. That's fresh. That's not like some... That you was know, Kratz last night in his basement. Old tape. No, that was last night. That was Kratz that was, and his that family. That was Kratz's son right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was Ethan Kratz. I was, I was really he angry. Was there. Although that wasn't my... My TV in my basement is 126 inches, so I think I oh, would right, break oh, oh, flex. Oh, what a... Watch. Yeah. W- watch. Boom! Oh. How's his hand? Can we see the, the knuckle? It, nah. There's got to be some blood. That's a lot of glass, no? Nah. No? Nah. You've but, broken a but, lot of TVs, Sale? No. I've seen Guy <laughs> punch one, though. Um, but, Kratz, have no fear because Zach Gallon has the perfect answer for you after you're breaking your TV. Can we show Zach Gallon's tweet? Make sure to get your tickets for your next game, Philly Spring Training oh 2024. See you in Clearwater, wow. Kratz. Wow. Are you kidding me? I didn't nope. know this. I saw what Blooper, what Blooper, the mascot from the Braves said. Wow. He, he tweeted, or Blooper tweeted, do they get a do you get a ring for NLDS championship? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh still not as God. good as uh Zach Gallon. <laughs> well, Zach Gallon saying that that is that, that is, is bold. Oh, where the, was there some bad blood that I didn't know about here? Yes. Like yes. There's He's, two there's isn't two he a problems. Phillies fan One, too? What? Wasn't he a Phillies fan growing up? I uh, thought I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, a Phillies yeah. fan, yeah. Yes. So so there's two things. One, everyone, you know, thought they were gonna lose. So they just were having fun with it, which I think it's great. And two, every player Kratz knows that's there, especially nowadays, like they are smart, calculated, going up against everyone. So I'm sure Gallon heard it and he's like, Cool, I'm gonna send it back. And then I don't know if this was in direct response to him, but some of our fans in the YouTube chat today said, are you going to talk about Taiwan Walker? Because he was like saying, like, oh, the disrespect. I think he's just, you know, pissed that he lost. And you see something like that. But we don't need respect, disrespect. That's fun. Keeping yeah. those receipts, Kratzy. That wasn't, just, yeah, that wasn't at the players. That was at the fans who were absolutely yeah, yeah. ripping him when he's warming up for game oh, one. Oh, I got you. Understood. But then we got our, then next, I don't know if Scott's going to run this, but we got Paul our Seawall. next, we got our next thing. My boy, Paul fucking Seawall. Look what he put it out. 
receipt season, which includes the Phillies post game show. The Philly Stars went cold tonight against Arizona, but Ricky Bo knows it's not time to panic. Well, it was time to panic. Uh, also, I've seen that pool before, so I know exactly where it is, according to DJ Garrett Stubbs, our guy, referring to the famous, I don't know how to pronounce that, but beyond the right field fence at Chase Field. If we take two here against Arizona, we'll be beelining it for the water. And then our, our friend Jared Carabas said there's a chance the stage is poorly to Tori Lovello saying we didn't come across the country to get our ass kicked. Oh, and God. lastly, great. I mean, this was really well done collage by Paul Seawald. He finished it with Too the much. famous Jordan meme. And I took that personally. No, Todd. Too much, man. dude. That's awesome. Dude, that's why we have this show. That shit's fun. Come on. Too much? The other one was good. He'd it, it, be just a little overboard. With that was a collage. Todd doesn't like collages. I, I'm not a collage. <laughs> I thought that was great. It was Todd, short, sweet to the point. With a collage for school Te- or something? Teach its own. Teach its own. I, 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 from knowing Paul, I, that's too much. I love no, it. Paul, dude, Paul came on here. They're down 0-2 and said they're going to win in seven. He solid. came on the show and said solid. I, I, I Did think he not? Solid. Oh, fuck. Someone just went down. Tell him. Paul, Say it with your Bible. That was Eddie Guardado. He he gone. Yeah, it's all right. He'll, He's like we're Mad Dog should be back. gone. Yeah. But <laughs> every every other day, Eddie. Now, yeah, <laughs> exactly. here's here's my thing. You've been there for two months. Uh, yeah, he wasn't there the whole year. It's okay. You won. I got it. You've been there for two months now. No, disagree. Pump Pump totally disagree on this one. I'm a fan. I'm all, I'm here for all the smoke. Because yeah. why? I ain't playing no more. Just smoke it up, boys. Fight it up. Talk shit. Let's go. It's good for the rivalry. It's good for the game. And, and Todd, the one thing I will say is it's not personal. Like, they're not going out there saying something personal. They're just like, yo, we took receipts. Like, don't count us out. I feel like that's fun. If somebody goes out there and says something, like, personal, okay, then it's different, right? You know what I'm saying? I was going to say he's not taking really shots at players, but he kind of did at Stubbs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, Stubbs I, I, put yeah, himself yeah. out yeah, there. Yeah, but he's saying but Stubbs, Stubbs, Stubbs says, says that. I listen, I get it. Also, if Garrett Stubbs, when when he comes on again in the offseason, we ask him about that, he'd be like, dude, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. he'd be like, I love it. I have my overalls on. I have my Budweiser hat on. It's good. I saw it. Yeah, but Todd, guys, Todd how about guys are good. in 17 when you got traded to the Yankees, you were there for two months. Like, you weren't just like – you were just like I didn't, ma- I didn't tweet nothing. No, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not saying you tweet, internet. but you talk smack. I yeah, was there within within the game. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't go online. But that's just more of a personal thing. Like people, no doubt. People, talk Every, smack. everybody did. Everybody did though. Yep. Yeah. Cracks all good. All good, got. man. They won. They won it. All good. Yep. You guys have been looking at my bald head all day. Anybody that's know it. what this is? It's a winter bowl hat for I, sure. I, I read the Aguilas. front. Of, I read the front of your cap. So Aguilas, right? Aguilas, Aguilas Cibaenas of Santiago, Dominican Republic. They didn't even give you a fitted man. What's that about? Oh, you got you got BP hats. It's the show. It's a show down there. <laughs> they didn't have one big enough. Oh, that's for true. That's for true. They didn't have one big enough for my pockets. How much money they were paying me either. Great Brad show, definitely guys. was Great like show. A, a cold hero down in the DR for, for his winter ball. Don't you think? They call me Pancheo. There's Pancheo's. like a fan club. They call me Pancheo because I struck punch out a lot. I was just saying punch out. <laughs> but if you embrace it, they love you. So. They embrace the strikeouts? I guess. I mean, many major league teams do. Uh, we got a show tomorrow. And it sucks not day. having games for all, like, all these days. I don't know how these teams are going to play. We should have started. Get some sleep, bro, you guys are bad, man. We should have had a game on Thursday. I'm so yeah. pissed off. The Cancun series. <laughs> See you Thursday. Maybe in Dubai. <laughs> Ooh.